Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council, and I'm going to call to order this adjourned meeting for Tuesday, December 13th, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Wansley. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Osmond. Present. Council Member Payne. Present. Council Member Koski. Present. Council Member Shaftai. Present. Council Member Chavez. Present. Council Member Ellison. Here. Council Member Vitaw. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. Council Member Goodman. <coughs> Present. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 13 members present. Let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. Next, we have uh, the adoption of our agenda. Colleague, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. Um, it's a continuation of our last regular meeting, which was this past Thursday. So this includes the single item that we postponed at that time to today. And that is the consideration of the proposed creation of the Community Commission on Police Oversight, which was brought forward by the Public Health and Safety Committee. And I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. Um, colleagues, uh, I just have a point of privilege at our um, budget markup committee. Um, I um, inadvertently voted nay on item number 16. And I would ask for your indulgence in me changing that vote. It was an affirmative vote. The actual item passed. Um, I had intended to vote yes on that and inadvertently voted no. And so um, I'll ask the clerk for um, advice. Should we do a roll call or? Madam President, perhaps we could set that aside at the end of the meeting. I don't have that particular set of actions in front of me right now. I can certainly try and pull them up uh, so that we can, as a body, understand the request to change a vote that was done at a previous meeting yes. that is adjourned. Um, and so perhaps we can take that up after we deal with the Public Health and Safety Committee item. I'll pull all the uh, information and share that with the council members at the dais. For, um, for your uh, assistance, and that is item number 16, uh, amendment by council members Chuck Tai and Chavez. Thank you. All right, as I've already noted, we have this single item for our consideration today, and that is the ordinance that creates the Community Commission on Police Oversight. This item was brought through our Public Health and Safety Committee. That committee submitted its report with a handful of amendments, which I offered and which were moved uh, by the Council Vice President on my behalf at that committee. Those were accepted and included in the report uh, from the committee at the council's regular meeting this past Thursday. The clerk has indicated that the record show council member Vitao moved approval of the report from the committee, which included a motion to approve the ordinance proposing the creation of this new oversight commission. Thus, the main motion is before us, which was postponed from last Thursday. That motion is to approve the ordinance. Since that time, I've had the opportunity to work with many of you on amendments to further improve that ordinance. Uh, those which I believe represent the consensus of the body have been incorporated by our city attorney in a new draft, which I am submitting as a substitute for this body's consideration. Before I open to general discussion, I just want to highlight the amendments that council members have brought forward I believe these amendments are improving the basic concept for this new oversight commission, and I think they are helping us to achieve our shared goals around increasing access, transparency, and accountability for police conduct in this city. To me, 
this substitute ordinance represents a consensus that reflects input from all of us. And I want to especially thank the city attorney's office for working with us to ensure uh, that each of these amendments only strengthens the core proposal and for helping us to get to this point where we have a document that reflects the consensus of the council. Truly believe that we are at a better place and that the product is significantly better because it reflects all of us. I want to just point out and highlight um, and thank Councilmember Payne for his inclusions on the data transparency and data access for the commission. Also for bringing forward regular reports uh, that both this body, the new commission, and the public can benefit from in understanding how police conduct is improving. I believe that these regular reports will help us to perform our oversight responsibilities and will give the public actionable data about the performance of our police department that helps to restore and build trust. I also appreciate the requirement for the annual public hearing as another opportunity for public engagement. I really want to thank Councilmember Chugtai for ensuring that this new commission will be grounded in the city's important anti-racism work and that this will be included as a required part of the orientation and operating rules of this new commission. I also think that um, she's incorporated best practices for training as a requirement. I think that this will be a key for future success in terms of larger reforms that we will consider for all boards and commissions. I also want to thank uh, Councilmember Chavez for bringing recommendations that will help ensure that this new commission remains accountable and for recognizing that individuals who serve on this body should have a record of building public trust, not division. Lastly, I'll thank Councilmember Wansley for working to build in safeguards for our commissioners so that they can do this un important work uh, unencumbered. I want to thank all of my colleagues for their engagement and contributions to this shared work. We know that this is just one more step in our collective efforts to improve police accountability and oversight. We know that this is an important step, but it's just one more step. There will be many more actions that we will need to take, but I maintain that this is an important step and truly believe that the substitute ordinance brings together the best that each of us have brought to the table. I also want to just take a moment to thank um, Director, um, Civil Rights Director uh, Alberta Gillespie and um, Mr. Andrew Hawkins for their work in bringing this um, ordinance forward and, and continually helping to craft and make it better. Um, your efforts are not unnoticed and are deeply appreciated. Uh, with that, I am going to move approval of the substitute motion that formally creates the Community Commission on Police Oversight. Is there a second? Second. Colleagues, uh, there is a motion before us to accept, um, to approve the substitute motion to create the Community Commission on Police Oversight and a proper second. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair? Yes. Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to say I think this is a really good ordinance. We have some last amendments to add to it today. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, and thank you for putting this consensus document together. It is a very truly good faith effort that has involved a lot of conversation with the city attorney's office, including the mayor's office, and, and I think helps everybody feel that they have been part of the process. It includes over 10, well, 10 suggestions from our colleagues, a couple of them like the residency requirement and the ability to clearly spell out how we add additional meetings to the body. Councilmember Chavez had those suggestions. He's not bringing those forward today, but those have been included in this document as well. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we, we will have further opportunity to shape this as time goes on, um, but I'm eager to get started on it. So thank you for doing this. 
thank you, uh, Council Vice President. Next in queue is Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to get some clarification from um, Clerk Carl about, uh, I do see there's a number of amendments that we like to consider to uh, Council President's uh, substitute ordinance and would like to make a motion to uh, have those amendments be considered. Uh, Madam President, to Councilmember Wansley's question, I also understand there are a number of amendments, and I believe at each of your places there's a packet that Mr. Daler put together in order. The first one on top has in blue text with amendments by underscore Payne. The next packet are amendments uh, with Chavez as the author. Next are amendments by Councilmember Shugtai, and I will note there is a motion to amend number seven by Shugtai that wasn't included to add to the end of that packet, and then a uh, packet by uh, Councilmember Wansley to amend. This is the point in time at which amendments should be brought forward if there are any. And obviously, in your speaker queue, it says that the Jenkins substitute is now before the body. So those who wish to bring those forward, I think, I think the idea is taking these packets in this order. Um, certainly, the president may have a different proposal, but that was my understanding, is that these, these amendments would come forward in that order, and then any further amendments before um, final consideration. Uh, yes, that's perfectly acceptable, and um, which means now is the time to bring forth those amendments. Um, does that answer your question, Councilmember Wansley? Yes. Do we have um, a proper second on that? So I believe that Councilmember Koski is in queue and may have a comment. Um, the first packet to take up would be Councilmember Payne. So if Councilmember Payne gets in queue, he could speak to his um, packet of proposals. We should um, discuss and take action on any of those proposals that are in the packet. The next in queue would be Councilmember Chavez. We, and then we'd have all the discussion and debate on each of those issues. When we finish the packet from Chavez, we'd move on to Councilmember Shugtai. When we finish those amendments, we'd move on to the packet from Wansley. So each of the amendment packets or each of the individual amendments within the packet from each of those council members would be considered individually. There could be comments, debate, and vote on all of them individually, or at the body's discretion, if all of them are acceptable, we could vote on the amendment packets as a whole. So I'll look to the president for direction on how you want to handle that. But I believe Councilmember Koski may have a comment. Mm -hmm. And then Councilmember Payne is in queue to speak to his proposed amendments. Uh, thank you, Clerk Carl. Uh, Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Madam President. I just did have a question around um, one of the sections. So I just want to make sure I'm clear about if I'm in order or out of order here. Is it okay to ask a question about your substitute motion? Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so if we go to section 172.6, number five. Um, so I agree that all members of the body should have a, a commitment to equitable non-discriminatory -disc po policing, but I'm just curious to know, does how does one demonstrate that commitment and how does one meet that qualification? Uh, for the second qualification uh, in this subsection, we say that the Civil Rights Department shall implement procedures to ensure that candidates meet the second qualification, but who will implement uh, the procedures for, the, for these qualifications? And I'm just wondering if that can be more clearly spelled out. I'm not sure exactly who's this, is this who's amendment this was originally so uh, it's okay. council member chavez yes council president jenkins council Murkowski. my intention was this one was to ensure that later on down this path we're going to figure out if we have police officers on this commission or not and we want to make sure that anybody in this commission has public trust knowing that like if someone has enacted police brutality on a constituent or resident of minneapolis or has enacted some form of or paying it to a community member through discrimination that they aren't able to be a part of this specific commission. So the goal of this is to make sure that if a police officer or someone is a part of this commission, that they're not non-discriminatory to community members. I had original language that had a white supremacist ban on this commission. And after talking to our city attorneys, we came up with a new language that was more broad and that's how we came into this decision. So my understanding is that the civil rights department will be helping shape what this looks like in the future. <coughs> Oh, okay, thank you. That's helpful. I was just wondering if 
we could strengthen that language so that, that it's really clear that the Civil Rights Department is, um, you know, going to be the one to implement this and ensure I do have some language that I can pass around to update this and I can hand that out to see if this would be, you'd be open to this. Again, this is just to strengthen what we have here. So hold on, let me hand, pass this out. Mr. Daler is running to make copies, I think, of that for all members of the dais. It's a good reminder to us all. If you do have amendments, the rules require any amendment to be in writing, and we need enough copies for everybody at the dais, plus some additional copies for the public. So uh, the clerk will certainly try to help with that, but if you want to send those to us now, um, or your offices can certainly make them, I'd recommend we make about 25 copies of anything we're going to pass out. Yes, I am. Council President, I am more than happy to I'll move this with the council member. I'm not sure the procedure, but I'm assuming we just adopt this amendment, the substitute motion. Council member Koski is moving an amendment, I assume. I haven't seen it yet, and it sounds like council member Chavez is seconding that amendment, and then we can vote on it. So council member Koski has offered an amendment to strengthen the um, amendment offered by council member Chavez. Um, Madam president, I, is there a way to get a copy of this in a chat? I know typically as Clerk Carl just noted, we need to have copies of this, but could Council Member Koski seems like wasn't able to be prepared to do that. So could we get a copy of that in the chat, like the language just to the see? Clerk is coming around with copies right now, which will be also for the public. And while he's doing that, I'll uh, explain if you're looking at the amendment within the substitute packet number five, it says shall be persons with a demonstrated commitment to equitable non-discriminatory policing. The civil rights department shall implement procedures to ensure that persons appointed under this section do not have a record of taking actions which would undermine public trust in the individual's ability to conduct civilian oversight of law enforcement in an equitable and non-discriminatory manner. Koski's proposed amendment separates that into two subsections, A and B. It rephrases it to say the civil rights department shall implement procedures to ensure all persons appointed A, have a demonstrated commitment to equitable non-discriminatory policing, B, do not have a record of taking actions which would undermine public trust in the individual's ability to conduct civilian oversight of law enforcement in an equitable and non-discriminatory manner. Perhaps it's a little editorializing. It feels like the Koski rewrite is a little bit more directive and says the Civil Rights Department shall take actions to implement procedures to ensure these things. I think the intent is the same. It's just a, a change in giving the civil rights affirmatively a duty to implement procedures that achieve A and B. I certainly don't mean to speak for you, Councilmember Rakoski, on behalf of your amendment. Is that the role of civil rights or the appointing body? Council, uh, Council President, I think um, it certainly is the responsibility of the appointing authority, which is the mayor and council, as they're making those appointments to make sure that the nominees you bring forward and ultimately appoint comply with the qualifications in the ordinance. I think this gives the implementing and administering department, in this case civil rights, which manages this function for the enterprise, a, an affirmative uh, you know, prospective uh, responsibility to take those actions and implement procedures since the departments do help with recruitment um, and the nomination procedures that are considered by this body. So I would say it's a, it's a double responsibility. Ultimately, the appointing authority is accountable for who they appoint. I think this gives the Civil Rights Department the responsibility for as they assist council and mayor in making those um, nominations and ultimately appointments that the candidates have been fully vetted and screened and comply with these requirements set forth in the ordinance. The city attorney may have other comments to make as well. Uh, City Attorney Anderson. Sorry, 
Um, Council President, I, I agree with, with Mr. Carl's in interpretation. It's, it's really making, I think, clear what, frankly, I think already was contemplated in, in uh, Council Member Chavez's language that the Civil Rights Department will actually be the department that's implementing the, the hiring process, the background check, all of those things. And so I, I think that this, uh, Council Member Kosky's amendment simply makes it clearer that the Civil Rights Department is really the, the functionary in that assisting the appointing authorities in, in the appointments. Thank you. Um, and I know we have um, Council Members Payne, Palmasano, Vitao in queue, but I am wondering, are you in queue to speak to the Koski Amendment, which is on the floor right now, or the overarching amendment or motion that's on the floor. Madam President, I, I, I could be incorrect, but I assume Councilmember Payne got in, in queue because of my urging to speak to his entire packet of amendments and probably is not in queue to speak to this particular issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Councilmember Vita wishes to speak to the Koski Amendment or is in queue for something else. All right. Let me go to the council vice president who has a point of order. Maybe that might clear things up. Council yes, member, um, council vice president. I, colleagues, I think we need clarity at how this all will transact. And I wanted to, to lay out my intent here today to deal with everybody's amendments that I've seen up until like an hour ago. Um, I have suggested to the council president that we take these in order. So right now, I believe we'd be voting on this consensus document. We could do it as amended because it seems like a very friendly amendment, says Councilmember Chavez, um, to this inclusion on the consensus document. Um, but then I would like us to please go in order of the packet, as Mr. Daler put it on our um, yeah, on the dais for us, and we have every person, everything that they are bringing forward outlined here. Councilmember Payne's is, is a packet, but I'd suggest, if that would be all right, that we split this out and we can name what's already been included, because a couple of these things have been included in the consensus document, and go from there in, in the order that Councilmember Payne suggested. There's also times that there are duplicates between different council members, and so that's why I've suggested the specific order to the council president so that we can make sure that we aren't missing anything, that we get through all of it. Um, it does, council member Chugtai include that seventh one that you had. Um, and, it, and I would ask that any others that might be coming forward come at the end. Yes, come with all the you know, numbers of copies, but please if you could wait till the end if you really don't have your amendments done to this point. Um, that would help us get through all of these in an orderly manner. That's my suggestion. Yes. So we have the Koski Amendment to the um, consensus uh, ordinance. Is there any further discussion on that? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. So that amendment has been accepted, and now we have the. Um, the consensus document before us, uh, and that document has been properly seconded. That uh, next in queue is Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I, I originally got in queue to introduce my amendments after this vote, but in looking at the amendment packet, there's an outdated version that was presented. Uh, I had been working pretty closely with the city attorney and some of those changes weren't reflected here. So those are getting printed out right now. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's go ahead and vote on the consensus document, and then we can come back to my amendments once those printouts arrive. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. 
Well, I'm sorry, I missed something. So Chavez's amendments are next in queue. If there are changes made to what we had from Councilmember Payne, while we're waiting to print the corrected version of that, Councilmember Chavez has a series of five amendments that should be in your packet. And so these amendments would be in front of you, and I heard the Council Vice President suggest that we take each amendment individually. All right, Councilmember... Chavez. Thank you, Council President. The current ordinance that we have right now gives the mayor seven seats and the city council eight seats. And my amendment basically gives equal representation to every ward to be able to have someone on the commission from their ward. Uh, for my experience, I, I, I know in my ward, George Floyd was murdered on 38th in Chicago by the Minneapolis Police Department and it caused a worldwide racial reckoning. And I think it would be a disservice to not allow wards that have witnessed police brutality and police violence to have a guaranteed seat on this commission. So my amendment would guarantee that a place like Ward 9, Ward 8, and every single ward in reality can have a say on how this commission is gonna be, so. Uh, Council Member Chavez has moved um, that the Community Commission on Police Oversight shall be composed of 15 members, 13 of whom are appointed by the um, City Council and two uh, shall be appointed by the Mayor. All commissioners shall be appointed to the specific seats and terms in conformance with the open appointments process as set forth in Title II of this code. In order to stagger the expiration of terms, the original appointments of the commissioners shall be for terms of one or two years as determined by the city clerk. Therefore, I'm sorry, thereafter appointments shall be for three years. Um, is there a second for this motion? Second. Uh, we have this first amendment by offered by Council Member Chavez and it has a proper second. Any discussion? Council Member Vitao, are you in queue? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm just wondering if this language, I support the structure and the number, but I'm wondering if this language uh, speaks to each council member making an appointment because it says 13 appointed by the council. Does that mean that we all get one each? I think we need to define this a little bit better than just the council gets 13 appointees and the mayor gets two. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Council Member Chavez did uh, attempt to address that, but, um, okay. and I would interpret it as each council member uh, makes an appointment, but please, Council Member Chavez, yeah. clarify. Council President, and thank you for the great question, Council Member Vita. I worked on this language with our city attorneys, and we modeled it after the click appointments. And the click appointments, the city council is able to appoint two per ward, and it's modeled after that language as well. So based on this language and my conversations with our city staff, this is allowing us to be able to appoint one member per ward. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out, this is something that we've gone back and forth on. And frankly, I'm of two minds on it myself. On one hand, um, when one council office has one named person there or not, it tends to, that position tends to be filled more often, stay filled more often. Um, on the other hand, I think to Council Member Chavez's point, that the idea of being able to have um, seven appointed citywide would enable exactly what he said, which would to be able to add more seats in areas where there are specific concerns and specific nuances to consider or people who have specific skills um, to put forth. So um, I appreciate both of these ways of thinking on it and I just, I wanted to point that out that I do think that then this should be um, ultimately done as a, as an a, a by ward kind of language, I'm not sure it, 
Councilmember Chavez says he modeled it after the click language, so um, I can appreciate that and just go with that as, as that's this alternative. The attorney is. <clears throat> Council President members, if you wanted to um, put some clarity in this, um, I would suggest that um, in the second line after uh, city council, comma, I would add one per ward, comma, and two, et cetera. Attorney Anderson, um, is that acceptable to you, Council Member Chavez? Yes. Yep, Council President Jenkins and our city attorney and, and the clerk, I would say that if there is no more debate or questions on this, that I would move to accept the language from our city attorney onto this uh, amendment, and then I think we can take a vote on that. Thank you. We have uh, some additional... Oh. Councilman Rainbill pulled himself out of queue. All right, is there any other discussion on this? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, and that amendment has been adopted. Next, uh, do you want to go to yep. your next um, yep. amendment, Councilmember Chavez? Yeah. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. The second one was already adopted on the consensus one, so we don't have to look into that one. Thank so I'll you. move on to the third one. There has been a lot of issues raised with the FBI background check. I know that. Uh, in my, my personal opinion, it would exclude specific members who have been impacted by police brutality to be a part of this commission, and it would make it so undocumented immigrants will struggle more by joining this commission. So my amendment, basically, it's, it adds to this background check that if any member does not pass or take a background check, they may still qualify to serve on the commission, but should not be eligible to serve on review panels that involve access to data for which background check is required. There must be at all times at least 10 members in the commission who have passed a background check. So basically, uh, this would require, this would allow people to be able to serve on the commission um, that otherwise wouldn't have been able to participate, especially our communities who have been impacted from you know, these background checks and our immigrant community members who may not feel comfortable uh, joining this commission because of it. Uh, Councilmember Chavez has moved amendment number three um, relative to eligibility for services. Is there any discussion? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah. I mean, potentially there could be five members who are not able to be panelists, which seems like that would put an extra burden on the remaining 10 members. Um, Councilmember Palmasano is in queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify, um, Councilmember Chavez has a further amendment to go a little further than this, yeah. uh, further on. Um, I appreciate this one because I think it really does lower the barriers to entry as much as possible. It does, as you just said, put a little bit of extra burden on the rest of the commission if there is somebody then that is going to opt out of a background check. Um, but so long as, like he has in his language, there are at least 10 members who have passed the required background check, then maybe that burden isn't too much. It really just opens up the availability of people being able to apply that might not otherwise do so. Um, because of the FBI background check. And we need to have, um, it, that is something that really strengthens this whole ordinance is being able to um, give a lot of extra information in detail to members of this very public commission. So um, 
So I appreciate this as the way that we can lower the barriers as much as possible without, um, without going so far as to um, not have them having really redacted things to look at. So thank you, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President. Uh, I will recognize the city attorney, uh, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Council President, uh, Council Members. Just for point of clarity, what this amendment will do is allow for uh, individuals who don't take and pass the background check to participate in panels as long as those panel uh, investigation reports and, and other data do not contain criminal justice information system data. So it's not a complete exclusion from participation on the panels. It would simply be that staff would ha have to make sure um, when assigning folks to the panels that, that it is on investigations that do not contain any criminal justice in, in information system data, just as a point of clarity. Thank you, Attorney Anderson. Uh, City Attorney Anderson, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Allison. Aye. Council Member Vitao. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that amendment is adopted. The next amendment is offered by Council Member Chavez. Council President Jenkins, thank you. Uh, this amendment is more of like an evaluation and checks and balance, I would say, on our police department. So it allows the community commission on police oversight to do a yearly evaluation on the performance of the police chief. The evaluation should include, but it's not limited to feedback on strengths and areas of improvement. I think this is one tool we have in our toolbox for police accountability that the council has the power to enact today. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. Um, is there a second to this motion? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for our city attorney. Uh, right now, that who, who reviews the chief of police? Uh, Council President, uh, Council Member Rainville, um, the, the responsibility for the evaluation of the performance of the Chief of Police would either be Commissioner Alexander or the Mayor or, or some combination thereof uh, as, as the appointing authorities for that, that position. Okay. So if, if I may, uh, uh, Council Member Chavez, what is your intent with this? Yeah, uh, Council, Member, Council President Jenkins, Council Member Rainville, this language is similar to the one that was taken out with this new ordinance. So our former PCLC had language on a yearly review and oversight and evaluation on the police department. This simply would just put language back into what was taken away. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Koski. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I was wondering too, maybe Councilor Chavez, you could um, help me with this. I'm just curious to know what the evaluation will be uh, based on, uh, or so, or what is the rubric for the evaluation for the chief? Then. Yeah, I mean, right now it would just allow the the commission that we appoint, based on how things go today, to be able to have a meeting to discuss the evaluation on the police chief and report back. I would say to the mayor, the council and the Minneapolis Police Department. There isn't a specific metric on how to conduct this. This is work that has been done in the past and I would just want to make sure that there's language in this commission today to make sure that we can do that work. Okay, thank you so much. Council Member Asman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the creation of this committee, uh, the main, main focus is to um, have oversight of police conduct with public, um, kind of give him different task of fitting um, the work of the chief is doing uh, and um, uh, having um, them to do uh, some, uh, I guess, you know, evaluation each year and 
uh, reporting back that to him, to the chief, I don't know how that will be helpful. Um, um, I think it will kind of will put them, uh, will give this uh, group more work um, in that level of uh, their main focus should be uh, conducting uh, the conduct between uh, the public and the police and give us back a feedback, a better way to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the relationship um, you know, it's uh, between the public and, and the police give us back a feedback that we can make a better policy and making sure that we're keeping our residents safe and holding the police accountable. So I don't, I don't really see how this will be helpful doing the evaluation. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I really appreciate this coming forward, and I think that we should uh, support this amendment. Um, you know, often, you know, we all know how workplaces should work. Uh, you know, folks who are overseeing you should have uh, a sense of how you're doing. Um, but I think that the relationship that we've seen play out time and time again between the executive office and police leadership has been, you know, mayors stick by their chiefs and um, and uh, and any kind of background conversations, any cr critiques that might be happening aren't accessible to the public. Also, I think that um, more than any other um, department um, leading position in the city, uh, chiefs have been measured by their intangibles, by their likability, by uh, their ability to speak to community, which can which is an indication of something, something good that we value, but it's not an indication of everything. It's not an indication of how well they're doing. And so I think that to have an independent body in it, like that can, that can take a look, an objective look, a more objective look, um, and, and create a little bit of transparency with the community is, uh, is a value add. Uh, again, this is not by any means saying that this is gonna tell the mayor or uh, the commissioner of public safety what to do with this information. But the fact that, that we could have this information um, and, and ensure um, that, this, uh, that we take this out of the hands of political relationships or, um, or, or any of those other stickier situations that can become personal, that can become political and politicized, uh, I think this gives us a level of objectivity that the community can trust, uh, that the council can trust, um, and, uh, and a level of access that, quite frankly, we, we haven't had before. So that's why I'll be supporting this. And, um, and I hope that we can support this or at least find some way to approximate this if we're not gonna pass this today. Thank you, uh, Council Member Ellison. Uh, I will recognize the city attorney, uh, Kristen Anderson. <clears throat> Thank you, Council President, Council Members. Just a point of fact, the existing ordinance um, provides that the uh, PCOC or the, the oversight group will, quote, contribute to the performance review of the chief of police. So it is, it is a bit different from the language in front of me. Uh, thank you, um, Attorney Anderson. And I apologize to my colleague, Councilmember Vitao. Uh, you had some comments or questions? No apologies necessary. Um, our council just uh, answer one of my questions, but the second question I have is, does the Public Health Advisory Committee review the Commissioner of Public Health? Does this happen in any other department? Can anyone answer that? Madam President, I can uh, make a good effort at that, and that is that no, there is no other advisory board or oversight commission in the city that participates um, in the review of a department head. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Chuck Tai. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to add to the discussion um, on on this amendment that um, I, you know, I don't see this as creating more um, unnecessary work for this commission. In fact. You know, I, I don't think there is a, a real or constructive manner by which um, residents give their feedback on the strengths and the areas of improvement um, for the, the chief of police. Um, and so formalizing it through this body so that there is, there's a constructive and documented way 
that that feedback is being uh, received. I, I do think that that is really important. Um, and I hope this is this can I hope this passes, and then I hope there's a way for us to um, apply this type of relationship between the our appointed uh, boards and commissions um, and department heads in in other ways, right? Uh, the the example that Councilmember Vita just brought up um, is a is a really good one. Um, oh, I think one of the one of the pieces of feedback that we often hear from our appointed boards and commissions is that their opinion isn't taken very seriously. They don't do a very meaningful um, body of work and inviting them into to giving feedback in this way, I think is, is really important and a, an important part of further engagement and empowerment of, of residents in um, the way that the city works and functions. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I won't be able to support this as written. I um, was able to speak with um, Commissioner Johnston about it yesterday. I just don't think this is an objective look at one of our um, city leaders. It, this could be one element of like what people in corporations call 360 reviews, right? Like a point of feedback from one way that uh, is one element of somebody's job. Um, we were discussing this in a leadership meeting yesterday. The mayor and the commissioner seem open to putting out some kind of you know, effort to, to ask how this body you know, feels that they're doing based on the information they get, but there just isn't adequate information here to be objective at all. Um, the current language of the PCOC is, is fine that way in terms of it not being a review. This language is not to me. Another suggestion I want to make is that um, they could, if they wanted, this body, if they wanted, choose to hold a public hearing. That might be more informative and be like a take of how the, how the public views the chief instead of just basing it on the documents and the more narrow focus that, that a civilian oversight body has. And I know that Councilmember Payne has an amendment in the consensus document that has a public hearing annually where the commission sets the agenda. So this is one of those things I think that the commission could choose to add if they see that as being valuable. So I won't be able to support um, this particular amendment today and I just wanted to explain why. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Vice President. And I did put myself in queue. Um, I think Councilmember Palmasano covered most of what I'm thinking, and that is that I, I can really see this body um, sharing their thoughts, ideas, opinions on the process and the chief's... Um, the chief's, I guess, ability to take their recommendations and whether or not the chief acts on those recommendations, that seems to be a role that this body can play. But the overall job performance, I mean, I, th I think we all have an opinion about how someone may be doing their job. Um, and, and it should be way like any other. I'm not sure if we need an ordinance for that body to be able to offer that opinion. Um, in fact, our boards and commissions do offer <laughs> their opinions quite regularly. Uh, and rec recommendations. So I, I'm just not clear if this broad language needs to be a part of the um, ordinance. Maybe if we tailor it down, uh, that could be <coughs> impactive, impactful. Um, Council Member Ellison, I believe. 
I'll keep it really short. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I've already made my case for the for the amendment, so I won't I won't uh, double down on that. Um, and I appreciate the discussion. I will say um, that there are, I think, a lot of ways that we could um, develop an objective measure of how a police chief is doing. Um, you know, I know that there was a uh, a point of debate between uh, members of the community, the uh, uh, um, the MDHR and the department about discipline, for example, just using that as an example, and that there was a debate about whether the amount of discipline that was being uh, purported to be happening was actually happening. You know, uh, I never got, I, I don't know that any of us ever got the final answer on on that or uh, or anything, but there was, but there was certainly no objective way for us to measure that or for us to for us to take a real accounting of that I think that that uh, that having someone who can uh, analyze and give that kind of feedback uh, would be and and have no um, uh, uh, vested interest in the outcome of that could be really valuable for us as a council for the mayor for 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 everyone uh, the other thing I'll say is that um, is that the the chief of police is fundamentally a different job than other department heads i know we don't want to admit that but no other department might get this kind of review but no other department is empowered with killing our residents right and and the police are not uh the police are uh that's not their job to do but they are empowered to do that when they when when the when the when the occasion arises mm -hmm. it's just true and so i think that with that kind of power with that with being empowered in that way by the state by us as residents uh, there is a level of review. There is a level of um, of accountability that should coincide with that. Uh, and so, yes. So, I just wanted to state that, and and then also just go to, sort of drive home the point that we're not exactly comparing apples to apples here, right? When we're talking about other department heads and the chief of police. Um, that's all. Thank you, um, Council Member Payne. Thank you, President Jenkins. Building off of a comment Councilmember Ellison made, you know, there, we have to follow the incentives here and the incentives are for elected people to look very good to their constituents. And uh, that's, I think that's a pretty non-controversial statement, but where the controversy arises is how do you make bad things look good? And I think that there is a long practice of doing that in many governments. This is not a targeted, you know, comment on anybody, any actors here at this time. But I think that one of the ways that we can short circuit those incentives is by putting this type of language into the ordinance. Because if we just leave it up to the body to decide how they would want to use an annual public hearing or you know, how they would, might, may want to publish reports or when they want to publish reports or what they would want to publish reports on to bring some more transparency to the department, I think that if we don't have this language in the ordinance, it may or may not get included to have this type of review for the chief or may or may not be included to have these kinds of comments be brought to light to the public. And I think we also have to remind ourselves that we are still actively in a reactionary mode following the murder of George Floyd in our city. And this is the very first, you know, document that we are creating as a body to directly respond to that in our capacity as city council. Um, and we have to remind ourselves that we're all still traumatized from that, and we're only thinking about all of the toxic, abusive elements of the history of our police department. But I would hope at some day in the future, we're gonna be celebrating the effectiveness of this department, and that would be re reflected in an annual review as well. And so this isn't just about bringing up abuses and making sure that we have accountability when bad things go wrong. This is also about bringing transparency when things are going right as well. And so I think if we just leave it up to this commission to decide what type of transparency and accountability we wanna see based on their prerogative, this might get lost, but I think it is important for this body to bring forward some of these uh, insights, observations, concerns, whatever, you know, is the rubric that would make most the most sense, we should at least give some prescription here to, we would like to see some type of review of our police chief, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, thank you, Council Member Payne. And again, I, I, I think it's broad, it, it, it sounds like the amendment says that this commission will 
provide the performance evaluation for the police chief. Um, and I, I think in the previous PCOC ordinance, it said that they could contribute to the performance review of the police chief. Um, so to me, it's, it's too broad. Um, this, this group doesn't interact with the police chief any more than anybody else in our city. They, they will they will be overseeing police complaints and at some level they can make some thoughts about the chief but really what they're looking at is the uh, behaviors and accountability um, or lack of accountability for police officers. Um, Sorry for that editorial, Council Member Chavez. Council President Jenkins, two consent decrees, rubber bullets in people's eyes, calling my community beaners, police leadership lying about the murder of George Floyd. That's what this is about. I'm gonna make a substitute, a motion, a mo a substitute motion to my amendment to uh, basically edit this based on the, what the Council Vice President, Council President said to something that I hope you both can support that will say contribute to the annual performance review of the Chief of Police which is work that already happens, but was removed on this ordinance. Uh, thank you, Council Member Chavez. Uh, next is Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you also, Council Member Chavez. I'm really excited to support the substitute motion, which just according to Council, our Council uh, Anderson uh, actually follows uh, presidents with the PCOC um, and the way in which they related to performance reviews of the chief. So thank you for uh, allowing us to have language that reflects a current legal or legislative presidents that's been set. Um, I also want to just make some comments in regards to, you know, this, this feeling that we're allowing the public to weigh in or influence or have too much influence over, uh, you know, the, role of a department head, specifically uh, MPD. And I just wanna note that throughout this year, it seems like that has been a practice that we've come to adore here. I will name, you know, just the mayor uh, public safety work group that he formed at the begin beginning of the year, invited all sorts of uh, people across political spe spectrums, even in his pre uh, press conference, he was like, I'm excited to have the team of rivals, part of my public safety work group, to help shape our public safety priorities that actually led to us having our Office of Community Safety. Also, we'll note, even just amongst his body, Council Member uh, Vita led the charge to work with community members to create the police chief uh, search work group, where we, again, invited community members to help us in the selection of a new police chief. So we've been doing this intentional work of partnering with you know, community members and residents and shaping not only um, our new public safety system, but also the leadership that's going to be uh, you know, at the helm of directing this new system. Uh, so I wanna note that this actually, again, doubles down on a president that this body has actually been you know, moving forward this year in particular. Um, and also I wanna note the question around evaluation metrics. Uh, one thing that I'm excited about, you know, us having in the city enterprise is we actually have a, a department that we move uh, through the government structure ordinance to do exactly this, to craft uh, or work in partnership with the mayor's office, with the commissioner Alexander, with so many folks. And I'm naming the Office of Performance and, and Innovation. Uh, sorry, I can't if Director Smith, you're around, I'm sorry, I messed up your name, but you, that's what you're gonna be, OPI. Um, they are charged with literally creating performance metrics in partnership with department <laughs> leaders and staff in this council. So we already have staff that are more than equipped and capable of developing a robust standard of metrics um, that the CCPO can use and also help shape. So we have everything that we need. We already have presidencies in place that we've done legislatively, um, culturally amongst this body to really support the substitute amendment that Council Chavez just offered. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next is Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to quickly say, I, I understand um, where Council Member Ellison was coming from about like the difference in the roles of the police chief than some of the other department heads. But I personally, as someone who's worked in public health for 20 plus years, the Department of Public Health is 
you know, just as important. We've just got through a global pandemic, almost not quite finished yet. So I would say that um, I get a lot of questions regarding what the commissioner of uh, public health is doing just as much, if not more, depending on the day than the police chief. So that department head is just as important. And I have a lot of people um, who I represent that would love to hear more uh, from that person than they do. The chief. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Member Vitao. Um, is there any further discussion? Uh, Council Member Chavez has um, agreed to um, amend the language to state um, that the Community Commission on Police Oversight will contribute to an annual performance review of the Chief of Police, um, which um, makes this amendment um, palatable for my support. So there's not any other discussion. I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vitoc. No. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. No. Council Member uh, Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 11 ayes and two nays. That amendment is adopted. Next, uh, amendment number five offered by Council Member Chavez. Uh, Council President Jenkins, I think we, I might just move this to the end. I'm having some conversations about this language. If we can just move on to our next colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we will um, move back to the updated ordinances offered by Council Member Payne. And I will call on Council Member Payne to introduce those amendments. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, I prepared two separate documents for our review. One is um, my amendments in line with uh, the ordinance, and then a separate uh, document that has a single amendment around the removal of members. Um, I think we should take these up one by one so that we can avoid confusion. I know there's a lot of paper moving around in uh, apologies, uh, this updated printout reflects work that I had done alongside with our city attorney over the weekend, and I think over the weekend shuffle, the, the minor edits that we had worked on together didn't weren't reflected in the LIMS file, so. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Payne, are we to be looking at two different documents, or is this consolidated into one? There are two different documents. One has all, uh, my amendments are in line with the original ordinance language and a separate document, <coughs> excuse me, I, for 172.60. Okay. Um, I don't know And the one that's in color is outdated of my full packet. Do you wanna start here? Okay, we're gonna start uh, with the stapled black and white version. Um, and my amendments are underlined and bolded. All righty. So, so for all council members, you should have a stapled packet. At the top, it says ordinance by Jenkins, and in uh, brackets, it says with amendments by Payne. The amendments that council member Payne is proposing are in bold underscore, starting at the bottom of page one, letter D, under section 172.20. Uh, and then... I'll also ask the clerk for guidance. Uh, some of my amendments are included in the consensus document. Shall we uh, skip over those? Should I, do I need to formally withdraw those? Yeah, if you just want to highlight them and we can just keep moving, that would be. Sure. All right, I will 
share the ones that are not included in the consensus document. Um, the first one that is not included in the consensus document is on page three uh, under 172.60. Uh, this was the 13 council appointments and two mayoral appointments. Council member Chavez's amendment just passed, so I'm gonna withdraw that one. Uh, and so the first amendment that I would like for us to take up as a body is um, on page four, number four, under the qualifications, uh, may not be a licensed peace officer, may not be a current licensed peace officer as defined by Minnesota statute section 626.89 subdivision 1C. And so this is to narrowly define uh, an exclusion around law enforcement membership. So if you have an active peace officer's license, you would not be able to participate uh, as a member, uh, but people with expired peace officer's licenses could participate as members. I'll second that. We have a motion and proper second. Is there any discussion? Uh, Council Member Rainbill. Thank you, Madam President. So, so I'm clear, Council Member Payne, you do not want to allow a licensed police officer on the commission. A currently licensed peace officer. Right. So I struggle with that because for us to go forward, we have to be inclusive, and I hear that from you all the time to be inclusive. This, to me, would be uh, not an inclusive uh, feature of this commission. Uh, we have our active members of our department who participate in the review panels, so their their voice is definitely included in this process. But but with your amendment, they would not be included in the overall commission. The the purpose of the commission is civilian oversight. If we allow licensed peace officers to be members of that commission, it could in theory be made up of all licensed peace officers, current or former. And it would kind of negate the purpose of civilian uh, oversight at that point. That's a real stretch of imagination. C Council Member Payne and Madam President, I think Council Member Rainville, to clarify and set context, this amendment deals with the seats that will be appointed by the mayor and the uh, council to the oversight commission. The review panels would have members selected to serve on the review panels from that membership of the commission and from members of the police department at the rank of, I believe it's lieutenant and higher, um, who serve concurrently with the civilian members on the review panels. The review panels have a different function, which is to actually review and make recommendations on disciplinary cases. The police oversight commission, separate from that review function, would then have a public interface to um, allow the public to engage in, in uh, understanding the police department's use of force policies and activities within the community. Um, so there's a, a dual function there with the commission and as I understand this amendment, it's to say that members of the commission could not be current members um, who are licensed peace officers. Not that peace officers wouldn't serve on the review panels themselves. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, I appreciate that. And Councilman Payne, I'm right down the hallway from you. It'd be great if you'd come down and explain this to me before I read it on a piece of paper on the dais. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilman Rainville. Uh, Councilman Rupitao. The clerk answered my question. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah. Um, I'll just share a little bit of um, information that um, we received from NACAL, which is the National Association of Civilian uh, Oversight of Law Enforcement uh, organizations throughout the country. And they, they talk about the participation of sworn law enforcement. And I'm quoting here, civilian oversight, as the name suggests, should be driven by civilians. With that said, there are, there are oversight entities that have successfully integrated sworn law enforcement into their models. In some cases, this can look like officers participating on the review panel. My editorial, we already have that. In others, it is members of law enforcement having a seat on the oversight commission 
forward, which I believe this amendment eliminate, seeks to eliminate. Um, there are still others that have civilian investigators working a lot alongside sworn investigators on misconduct cases. The key is to have the process be led by a majority of civilians that ensures that there isn't any way in which law enforcement has a greater say in the oversight process itself. Um, and then they go on to editorialize a bit more. As my comment suggests, this is a very complicated subject that always requires and warrants additional conversation and consideration by all stakeholders. I just want to, to add that context to our conversation. Um, and I don't think I see any further discussion. Council Member Chavez, are you? Thank you. Um, seeing none, um, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Rainville. No. Council Member Goodman. Is absent. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 10 ayes and two nays. That carries, and I will uh, return to council member Payne. Yes, the next amendment is under uh, organization H, and this is simply just a language cleanup. I, I believe the last uh, amended version struck through the mayor appointing the chair, yep. and the original language said in the absence of that designated chair, the body would uh, pick the next chair. This is just kind of more of a semantic cleanup of the language, just clearly stating that a chairperson and vice chairperson of the commission shall be elected by a majority of the appointed members. So it doesn't actually functionally change the language that was passed in committee as amended, but it just... This is in this, this, is in this version, right? Is this in the... I believe it is. Yeah. What came out of the Public Health and Safety Committee was an amendment offered by the president through the vice president, and in the current packet it says, the commission shall select from its membership a chair and a vice chair to serve in the absence of a designated chair. So I think the intent's the same. Yours rewards it to a chairperson and vice chairperson of the commission are elected by a majority of the members. But the commission selects its leadership in both cases. I'm happy to withdraw this. It's just I thought it flowed right. better. Very good. <laughs> um, so I can go to the next one under uh, powers. Uh, this is to address data. Uh, is this in the, um, apologies, is this in the uh, consensus document as well? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna skip, uh, withdraw that one as well. Um, down to M. Uh, the commission shall review and provide the mayor and city council with impact statements within, within 120 days of proposed changes to all policies, procedures, and special orders of the police department, which govern use of force or other subject matters addressed in federal or state court orders or federal or state court settlements, which pertain to the police department. So the intent of this is to ensure that the commission is reviewing policy changes by the police department, but when we were having discussions about this, we don't want them to necessarily waste their time reviewing every potential policy change, whether it's locker room assignment policy or something that is just the day-to-day -day administration of the department. We really want to narrow this to policy changes that are the most sensitive. Um, we went, we had pretty extensive, I had pretty extensive conversations with the city attorney around using court settlements or court orders as a proxy for meaningful and important policy changes. An alternative approach to this would have been to develop a very exhaustive list of every potential police policy that would be sensitive, but I think that that could be fraught if we miss something that wouldn't be included or um, include something that we later learn isn't as mission critical. So use of force is one that I really wanted to name all others are going to be in response to what we learned 
from MDHR, court settlement, or the DOJ consent decree. So policies that are changed in accordance with that, we want to at least have to bring forward impact statements so that not only us as council and the mayor can see those changes and have them highlighted for us, but so that the public can see those changes as well. With the caveat that things that are mandated by the court, this body doesn't have the authority to change those, but that's just a proxy so that we understand the significance of those policies and make sure that they are brought forward for review. Payne, um, Councilmember Payne has moved this amendment. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair, um, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this with Councilmember Payne. Originally, as he mentioned, it was about all. Um, policy proposals period for the police department um, and that would seriously take up all of the time of this body we felt so I appreciate your narrowing of it um, but I also see that 120 days may, might not be enough time to even develop an impact of some new policy and so while I, I would certainly put this on the short list of things we might want to consider for future improvements I'm not sure we should be so prescriptive um, in this document as we work to get this started today. So I won't be able to support it, but I thank you for bringing it forward and bringing it up. Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, just give me a second, because this is mainly directed at Councilmember Payne. I know he's getting some guidance right now. So as, as I'm reading this, you know, when I, impact statement it tends to be used at least uh, revolving uh, involving anything with the police department is typically like victim impact statements is this really more of like a policy analysis council member Payne? yeah i think all? i'm using impact statement i'm trying to find this right balance of this is not a full program evaluation so i'm sympathetic to that 120 day timeline being enough time to do a full program evaluation this isn't as comprehensive as doing evaluation um, it I, I'm using impact statement to say here goes either questions concerns or other considerations that the body should be aware of of potential impact of a given policy change and so one example and we didn't necessarily get into detail detail in talking about the MDHR but it's pretty far along the way in negotiations um, there may be something in the MDHR court uh, settlement that may suggest a policy but doesn't necessarily prescribe the specifics of that policy so there might need to be some additional policy work that is done in response to whether MDHR or DOJ consent decree that would be so the police department will and police leadership will interpret these court orders create policy to satisfy those court orders but it would be good to have at least a first and that like a first step at analyzing what the actual impact of that policy could potentially be. And is impact statements, and it, I notice it's plural, is, is impact statements though used elsewhere? Is this like a, a term? Because again, it's typically the context I hear it in is around those victim impact statements. Is this? I mean, I would welcome an amendment that brought clarity to that in terms of whether it's analysis or, you know, I, I was trying to avoid language like, evaluation which does bring a little bit more of an academic weight and rigor to it yeah but at least a cursory review of the policy change and what what the body's judgment of that policy change might be i'll say i like a cursory review <laughs> that you just said uh i think that one would certainly be appropriate um i have one other question with this is it says mayor and city council. I was wondering around the intent of city council, and the reason I asked that is because there has been a lot of confusion with uh, with statements being made out in the public spotlight, um, kind of conflating 
the council is somehow having the ability to set uh, police policy when that's clearly not the case. As I know you know this, and I'm just explaining this. And so I think the one piece I would want to be cautious of with, um, you know, certainly I would be very interested in any cursory uh, reviews of police department policies, but I also want to be careful that if this is provided in some official capacity to the city council, it's not perceived as or uh, could be mistaken as the council can somehow act on this from a policy standpoint, because I think we've all been trying to be very, very clear that we do not have jurisdiction over the police department that rests with the mayor. And so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, uh, Clerk Carl just uh, kind of nudged me with some language potentially around analysis and recommendations as opposed to impact statements. And, and, and specifically, you know, and I appreciate that, that language. And, you know, my question was really around oh, the mayor, mayor and city council. council. So I wonder if it would make sense to strike city council from this or, because if the commission is officially providing something, it would be public and on the record and something that. If I, I were to strike you know, or, or modify that, I would say uh, available to the public. Yeah, I think that I would say that would be preferable personally to having it say and city council because I think that would suggest that the city council can somehow act on a recommendation around police policy. I would accept both of those as amendments if you're suggesting. Happy to. Uh, council member Kosky. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm wondering, Councilmember Payne, if you could, um, I don't know if we're using the word impact statement right now, but is the intent to provide the impact statement within 120 days in advance of a vote on a proposed changes or within 120 days after changes have been voted on? I would say within 120, like the change, how uh, the, the chief makes changes or the administration makes changes to the policy or procedure, or procedure manual uh, and within 120 days. And I use 120 days because right now they're scheduled to meet four times a year at minimum. So at their next, I, I could actually even state with, within the next meeting, regularly scheduled meeting by the next regularly scheduled meeting. But that's the goal of that is a policy change happens Within 120 days, they they provide analysis and recommendations. Can I ask a clarifying question? So, if they haven't had a chance to meet yet to do that, you know, have that conversation and do the analysis. Let's say the next. Let's say a policy comes out and their next meeting isn't for 119 days, and then they meet. You know, I can. I guess I'm. Then they have that time to discuss, but then they only have one day to get that impact statement out. So I, I guess I'm. Does that make sense? I'm. I'm trying to like put the order in of the timing here. They can also call a meeting. They can call a special meeting outside of the four oh. regularly scheduled. So. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Relative to that, um, I mean, they would they would need to call that. I think we have a, a motion or amendment speaking to this later, but though that special meeting would need to be called 120 days in advance or whenever their last regularly scheduled meeting was, um, and they would need to then set a time specific. Um, I had a, a quick question though. Are we, so are MPD policies subject to a race equity impact analysis? Mm -hmm. uh, Madam President, I'll uh, attempt an answer here and if anyone else from civil rights uh, can answer or others. My understanding is no, 
that the formal race equity analysis that are required on citywide or enterprise policies, ordinances, um, budget items that you've seen at this level are not necessarily applicable to any department, not just the police department, but any department's operating policies. But those operating policies exist um, much lower in a hierarchy of authorities than do the enterprise-wide policies made by this body. Uh, departments typically enact those uh, operating policies, if I can use that term more broadly, under delegated authority from this body. So this body holds all the authority of the city uh, as a city government. It delegates that authority to departments. Within that delegated authority, departments create what we might call work rules, regulations, um, standards that the employees within the department have to comply with or comport to in delivering services and operating the day-to-day -day, uh, department services. And so within that delegated authority, the departments create those policies. I'm not aware that any department is required to use a race equity analysis in that regard at the operational level. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I, I will go on public record and say and it would be advisable too, but um, seeing as how it is not a requirement, this, this um, amendment may in fact be necessary. Uh, is there any other um, comments and uh, colleagues, the um, rewritten amendment is in the queue that incorporates Council Member Johnson's feedback, and I will read it as I don't think the public here has access to that. Uh, it reads, the commission shall review and provide the public with an with analysis and recommendation within 120 days of proposed changes to all policies, procedures, and special orders of the police department, which govern use of force or other subject matters addressed in federal or state court orders or federal or state court settlements which pertain to the police department. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. I don't have a roll call sheet. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vito. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman is absent. Council Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 11 ayes and one nay and one, abs one absent. That carries. Um, that amendment is adopted. Colleagues, um, I believe that's your last amendment, Councilmember Payne. One more amendment on the separate page. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, as our colleagues are leaving for uh, biological <laughs> reasons, and I have to as well, I am going to ask for a five minute recess so that people can take care of their physical needs and uh, we shall return to this meeting at 3.08. We are now in recess.
are the ones we had around. Um, um, so those are the ballots. Calling the meeting back in order. Um, next we have Council Member Payne Amendment to chapter 172, please conduct oversight. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this amendment uh, on the separate printout is to address the process for removal. Uh, this was developed in a, by a lot of back and forth with me and the city attorney around uh, some of the concerns that she shared that were raised by MDHR around removal for cause and what kind of complexity that can bring from a employment law perspective of which you bring considerable expertise. Uh, and so what I wanted to do is try to balance out uh, the need for independence and the acknowledgement that these are politically appointed positions. Uh, and so what I do in this amendment is I strike out all members of the Community Commission on Police Oversight shall serve at the pleasure of the appointing authority. Uh, ooh, and I'll just read it from beginning to end. So process of removal, uh, except as otherwise established by law or city charter, and to strengthen the independence of the commission, members can only be removed in accordance with the following provisions. One, the mayor shall give written notice specifying the basis for the intended removal to the chair of the commission chair of the audit committee, the city auditor, and the, city, and the council president. Two, the audit committee shall vote to approve or reject the removal within 30 days of receiving the mayor's notice of intended removal, following the input from the commissioner, the commission chair and city auditor. A special meeting shall be called by the audit committee chair as set forth by section 8.140. If a regularly scheduled meeting uh, is, uh, audit committee meeting is outside of the 30 day window, if the audit committee votes to approve the removal request, the matter will be referred to city council for a vote to approve or reject the removal within 60 days of receiving the mayor's notice of intended removal. And a majority vote of the full city council is required to approve removal. So what this does is it allows uh, any reason for a member to be removed. It just has to follow a process that ensures some level of independence because one thing that we wanna watch out for is some, a member of this body that is doing a really good job is going to be stirring up trouble, right? They're gonna be pulling forward conduct or behaviors that we don't want to see that might be embarrassing to us. Uh, and we want to have some protections for the, the people doing that important work. But we also wanna have the ability to remove people who are acting in bad faith or other, you know, very, meaningful reasons to remove somebody from the committee. So this amendment strikes that balance of making sure there are some protections, but ensuring that we have some control over, you know, good faith participation in this committee. Uh, thank you, council member. Does, does this amendment address if a council member then wants to remove a appointed member of this body? As of right now, I have it as the mayor, kind of honoring that executive position and having it be one person. But if I, I think I would absolutely welcome a council member, I could include that language. I mean, since the council is appointing the majority of the people of the body, I, I will I will know. As far as in my um, tenure. There's never been anybody removed from this body and or any other board or commission for that matter. Um, it kind of seems like this is a solution seeking a problem, but um, I is there any further discussion on this item? Yes. I'm sorry, my computer um, timed out. Councilmember Johnson. 
Thank you, Madam President. And that, that was just going to be a similar comment that I had. I was just going to ask our clerk, is, is my reading correct on this, that under at least the uh, Jenkins substitute removal would normally go through the council and require it to follow the council procedures and public notice and a vote. And I'm guessing council members would probably justify in some way or need to explain the rationale. And so, you know, at least as this is written, I'm seeing the clerk's head nod, so I'll take that as uh, an, accurate, uh, an accurate assessment of this. So, you know, as, as I am looking at this and I, I am very sure that this was not Councilmember Payne's intent, but this would be at least as specified a transfer of power from the council over to the mayor, uh, the way that it's currently written. I also personally think all of this additional process with all of these essentially delays are unnecessary or excessive. And so I think our current processes that exist today around how we would remove are sufficient. I mean, it's, as council president mentioned, I can't think of anyone removed before from any of these commissions or committees personally, and I think there would probably be quite a counter uh, pressure to doing so. So somebody would have to uh, either be non-participatory completely or behaving in such an egregious manner that it rises to the level that the council would go through that pretty unprecedented or extraordinary step. So uh, unless this was significantly reworded, I, I don't support this. Thank you. Councilmember Vitao. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I would just also say that I, I feel like this gives a transfer of power to the mayor. And I, I, it reads negative to me. It just kind of reads like, you know, someone can be taken off the commission if, he, I mean, Councilmember Payne's example was, you know, someone who may be making good trouble. But if others don't agree with that kind of good trouble, then they can remove them from this commission. So I can't get behind the idea of people who are there for, the 13 people will be there for 13 different reasons. And it may not align with everyone else. And I don't think it's fair to those people to then have to uh, lie in judgment of everyone else and they could possibly take them off the commission. So I, I can't support this. I think. Um, these are going to be adults who sign up to do this work, and we should let them work this kind of tedious thing out for themselves. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to your comment specifically, uh, Councilmember Vita. I think the intent, I think we share the same intent. We don't want people start making good trouble to be easily removed. And the previous language just says, that person making good trouble serves at the pleasure of the appointing body. So I've actually added more barriers to protect that person to make good trouble through this language. I just wanted to make, give that point of clarity. And mine is just that we all define good trouble different, so. Any council member Osmond? I have a question uh, for, thank you, council president, for the city clerk and uh, maybe city attorney. What is the process for other committees or commissioners? Uh, um, can you give us an example of deciding to remove the chair or what, how that process works? Uh, through the president, Councilmember Osman, we don't have an established process for removing someone. I've been city clerk since 2010. I've not ever seen us remove a member of a board or commission. Um, the process would follow, fall de facto to the council's legislative process, how they got appointed to remove them. We'd have to come through the similar process, which I think Councilmember Johnson just illustrated. I would, I think, take an opportunity to say here that as this body is aware, for many, many years, we have been looking at improvements to all of our board and commissions, reforming those to bring them more closely into alignment. And one of the issues that we've looked at at the staff level is exactly this. If there were a need to remove a board member, 
how would that be and for what reason or what purpose? And so um, there is for our um, ethical practices board, a quasi-independent body, what they call a participant agreement that they sign. And we've suggested this is something we should expand as part of our board and commission reform to all of our bodies. And what that participant agreement says is you'll go through an orientation program and you agree to abide by, for example, um, the city's code of ethics. You agree to abide by the Data Practices Act, by the Open Meetings Law, things that are applicable to how the bodies operate and conduct themselves um, and the policies adopted by the city council such that um, a disregard for those applicable laws and policies um, could then become the grounds for the council to take up action through its formal process to consider removing somebody. If that uh, were ever to become an issue, there would be a, a solid basis for us to say, ah, you deliberately violated the data practices, you, you deliberately violated the open meeting law, and the council should consider whether or not that merits consideration of a removal. Um, and so that's something that we would propose as part of board reform writ large that I think addresses some of those issues. Um, but to your specific question, how would the council currently remove that using the same legislative process that we use to get the appointments made in the first place? Uh, council member, council vice president Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't think this process and new responsibility has been presented to the audit committee. Well, I know that it hasn't been presented to the audit committee for review. I don't know if it's been presented to the city auditor for review, but if we're truly respecting the independent nature of audit committee, the city council shouldn't be prescribing them new duties and responsibilities. Um, right now, I just need to say our audit committee has zero oversight jurisdiction or authority over this type of topic and I don't really want to get into what it would probably take to try and make that whole. But I appreciate the problem. I think maybe when we solve it, we do it for all of our boards and commissions in a consistent way. Council Member Chuck Time. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, I, I support this, this amendment, and I think it's important for us to have um, a clear process by which members of this commission can be removed. It is really important for the group of people that is doing community oversight to have as much independence from the politics of the people who serve at any given time, serving at the pleasure of the appointing body inherently makes members vulnerable when they disagree with the people who appointed them and it makes people vulnerable when it, it makes people question whether they will be you know retaliated against in the form of removal when they state an opinion that's different from the appointing body or when they make the appointing body for example look bad in public these types of guardrails that ultimately will allow for this body to retain as much independence allowed within the current um, state law is a good thing. And I think we need those protections guaranteed for, for all members who serve on this commission. Councilmember Payne. I think that, um, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> I just wanted to speak to a point raised by uh, Vice President Paul Masano. Uh, we are still kind of actively defining what audit means under our new government structure, and I think we really need to reinforce that oversight function. And, you know, I, I, I raised this a number of times, you know, just by contrast, we spent 10 months on our government structure ordinance and we're spending maybe 10 days on this ordinance. And I, I really wish the ratio was the other way around right now because uh, oversight is the thing that really needs to be defined in this new government structure. And we really need to have some clear articulation of the role of audit in providing that independent oversight. And so one of the goals of this amendment was to start formalizing audit's oversight role when it comes to police accountability. 
I'll recognize City Attorney Anderson. Uh, Council President, um, this is actually to Council Member Vita's question about, about removal and, and how it's done in other cir circumstances. In the existing PCOC ordinance, removal is um, by vote of a majority of the City of Council and approval of the Mayor for incompetence, neg neglect of duty, misconduct, or malfeasance, or failure to participate in and complete minimum training requirements. Um, that Those terms are not defined anywhere and there's not a lot of process um, discussed, um, so I th think that the idea was moving away from that so that there is not so much ambiguity. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is just a uh, question for Clerk Carl. Uh, Mr. Clerk, are you aware of any other instances where the mayor would have with our boards and commissions, the power to begin the removal process for council members' appointments? Through the chair, Councilmember Johnson, no. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carl. I mean, I don't want whoever is mayor to be able to begin the removal process for my appointee, and so I'm just gonna say this is an unprecedented transfer of council power, and so, I think we need to be really careful with setting this precedent of that because I am sure there are council members that would have appointees that they would like that the mayor, whoever is mayor, will not agree with. And for the mayor to unilaterally begin the removal process after this body appoints that person is a pretty big deal. Thank you. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, actually, thank you for raising that, uh, Councilmember Johnson, because um, actually, and I think as a number of council members have articulated, at least if the mayor does decide to do um, something shysty like that, there's an actual public and, and, and transparent process as to which we can hold them accountable to. Right now, it, it sounds like even though there has not been that president set, that it could still happen, that retaliatory type of approach can still happen and there's no process in which we could refer to to say, oh no, you're in violation of that. Um, so i glad that we're in the process of actually putting guardrails in place that again, as the oversight body of our enterprise, this, this council, we can point to and say, oh, the mayor, it seemed like you did a retaliatory action there and you're going after this uh, commissioner that's doing good trouble. Um, that's a problem, let's deal with that. So I wanna say thank you for providing more clarity around a process that we currently do not have. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Wansley. And I think this may be your fourth time on this topic, Councilmember Payne, but please go ahead. Just trying to speak to everybody's questions and concerns. Uh, I, and one of the reasons I wanted to delay this is so that we could have that thoroughness of thinking through some of the language and the implications of some of the language. Um, I would welcome an amendment as opposed to the mayor giving written notice. I would say the appointing um, member who made that appointment, or it could just be mayor or city council member. Would that address your concern, Council Member Johnson? It would be an improvement over this language, Councilmember Payne. I still have, I still take issue with the timeliness of that because if I am the appointing member and I am able to, uh, able to, with that language change, provide that notice and start that removal process, clearly that would mean that that individual who I appointed is much different in the role or capacity than was expected. And, and I will say personally, I expect all of my appointees to be independent of my own ideologies or opinions on matters. And so it would really mean, frankly, that they would be absent and they would not be showing up to the committee. And in that case, if somebody clearly had a history of being absent and not showing up, I would say, after a demonstrated history, let's say maybe it's four months, I'll throw it out there. I say, you know what? They just haven't shown up. They're not showing any intent of showing up. I think we should uh, remove them and replace them. I could bring that up right now through RCA. It would have to go through a legislative process. 
that would take time, but this would add additional time where then the audit committee would need to get involved and that would take, uh, you know, this, uh, this 30 days of receiving the notice and then there'd be an additional window and then another 60 days uh, to, for another vote. And by then, a lot of time has gone by. And so that has an impact on this body. And so, yes, that language is an improvement. I still think this is overly bureaucratic um, when we already have a public process, a democratic process, a transparent uh, way of bringing this through as is. And there's, frankly, there's a lot of counter pressure to even removing somebody. So I think it's an improvement. If you're willing to do that, I think that's great. I still will probably vote no on this. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member um, Johnson. And then we have Council Member Wansley, Payne, and Chug Tai in queue. We have uh, still have a huge slate of um, amendments to get through. And um, Council Member Chug Tai. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll keep this brief. So it sounds like uh, there's the additional change that Council Member Payne is, is making. Um, and then I wanted to just make a hopefully friendly amendment um, to item to, sub to item number four, all the way at the bottom of this list. A majority vote of the full council is required to approve the removal. I would, if it's, if it's acceptable by the author, I would actually I wonder if it can say a majority vote of the commission and of the full council is required to approve the removal. Just building in additional protection. Thank you. days um, and so this nascent or troubled commissioner <laughs> will end up serving at least six months before they are able to be removed for good cause um, councilmember Osmond Thank you, Madam President. I um, would like to say that, you know, if such a removal happens, which hasn't happened before, we can always come back to improve the audience. This is not the final uh, decision. It's a working process. It's a learning process. So I completely ag agree Councilmember Johnson's position. We should move on. If such a thing happens, we can always come back and make those changes to improve. Thank you. I would add to that, we can actually remove a commissioner now without this language. Um, but um, is there any further discussion from my colleagues? Is there, I mean, Clerk Carl, did you have a comment? I just want to clarify my understanding for the body. I have the amendment from Councilmember Payne that we've been discussing in front of us, which is up for a vote. I know there was discussion about potential amendments to that. I never heard anyone make or a second come to any changes to it. So if we're to the point of a voting, I just want to clarify for all of us that what we're voting on is the motion as it was submitted by Councilmember Payne. Um. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And seeing no motions to come before this body, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. No. Councilmember Osmond. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and seven nays. That item 
fails, that amendment fails. And I believe that is the end of Council Member Payne's amendments. And now we move on to amendments by Council Member Chuck Tide. And I will call on Council Member Chuck Tide to introduce those amendments. Thank you, Madam President. Um, First, uh, I believe our clerks, while we were out on recess, came by and grabbed um, the outdated versions of these amendments, but you should have in front of you a packet um, with seven amendments on it um, that include all of mine, um, and we'll just take these up one at a time. We're starting with um, amendment number one, which um, amends section 172.1 um, on the, the police conduct oversight system being established. Um, and the Civil Rights Department and Police Department are named as each having responsibilities with respect to police conduct oversight. Um, and this amendment um, adds to it and instead reads the Civil Rights Department, Police Department, and City Auditor each have responsibilities with respect to police conduct oversight um, and carry out their respective duties and fun functions described in this chapter. Um, the reason for adding in the City Auditor, um, you know, I had a chance to speak pretty extensively with our City Attorney, our Civil Rights Director, and our City Auditor about this. Uh, but we know that our, our city auditor's office does a lot of work with respect to, to police conduct oversight and police practices and procedures and policy oversight. Um, the, the piece that feels really important to me is making sure that this body, this new, um, this new oversight body has as much um, independence from interference or the, the politics of the members um, who, who serve in leadership within the administration, within the council, um, and the city auditor's office maintains a high level of independence from the politics. Um, they are one of the few places in this enterprise where a person can go and where this commission can go to receive apolitical analysis and support the city auditor's office also has unrestricted access to all information, data, et cetera, that exists within, um, within the, the enterprise. We, through our budget amendment process, also moved um, to public safety auditors into the, um, into the city auditor's office, and we know that um, this work is already going to be happening within the auditor's office and it's making the connection between audit and this body more explicit. Um, we know I, you know, from speaking with the auditor, the city auditor, it sounds like there's already, you know, plans that are, that are coming into place around the, the relationship that um, these potential public safety auditors could have with this commission, but making that explicit in this ordinance is important so that it can outlast this existing auditor and um, and and be um, be a part of what we do, what this commission does moving forward. Thank you. Are you moving this amendment? Yes, I'm moving this amendment. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and proper second. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Moving to the next item, offered, amendment offered by Council Member Chugtai. The next amendment addresses mandatory training requirements, and these were included in the consensus document. Um, and so we don't need to take this up as a body right now. We will now move on to amendment number three, which addresses um, section 
172.3C, that's data sharing. Um, and this is, this is an extension of the First Amendment and, and bringing some consistency um, to, uh, to bringing that same consistency of adding in the city auditor's office into data sharing as well. And so um, this amendment um, updates the language to say information gathered as part of a complaint investigation shall be shared only with appropriate staff assigned to the Civil Rights Department, Police Department, City Attorney's Office, City Auditor's Office, and with members of review panels under Section 172.4 unless otherwise authorized by law. Um, I will move this amendment for the body's consideration. Second. We have a motion and proper second. Is there a discussion? Um, I would like to ask the city attorney, is there any concerns with um, sort of this broad data sharing, this broadening of sharing data? Um, council president, council members, I, I don't see a problem with it. I think that under uh, certainly ordinance and I think charter as well, the city auditor has general access to all data in any event. So. Um, including the city auditor here. So they could request this data at any particular time that they determine? Um, yes. Uh, that, that is my understanding of current, current law. Thank you. Did you have a comment, Council Member? Oh, Council Member Pamasano, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the city attorney's point, um, I believe the auditor's office already has the ability to request this if needed, but I'm not sure what the author's sense of purpose is of the auditor's office receiving this information. It's not like the council can direct them to do anything with this information, um, only audit committee. So if there's an idea that audit should be doing this kind of work, that would then get brought to audit committee for consideration. So I'm just curious about what the purpose is of this, if they can already ask for it and receive it anyway. Councilmember Chuck Tack. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, the, you're right, the audit, uh, the city auditor's office has unrestricted access to all data um, created in, in any department that they can request at any time and um, are required to receive. The goal here is that with each complaint investigation, um, when appropriate data is shared with the appropriate staff in civil rights, in the police department, in the city attorney's office, with members of the review panel, that that is also then flagged for the city auditor's office with the appropriate staff within the city auditor's office on a case by case basis. And there aren't further, there aren't barriers to that work happening since they can request it already. This is about further making explicit the connection to the, the auditor's office. They, Nobody here, you know, we, we don't have authority to direct any of the other named departments here to do anything either. Um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, Council Member Asman. I, I just, um, I think I heard city auditor office already have access to request any data they might want. Just copy in or CC in city auditor any data that's collected. What would they do with that data once they have it? We don't have a direction here that would tell them, well, you got a copy of the data. Here's what you have to do. Thank you. Did you want to address that, Councilman Chuck Dan? Uh, I mean, I, I guess the same could be said about any of the other named departments. There isn't direction given to them of here's what you go and do now that you have access to this information. Um, just now, we approved an amendment that names the city auditor's office as having a role in supporting members of, um, in carrying out their work as it relates to police oversight and as it relates to this body. Um, 
but we don't tell this body in particular doesn't tell any department within this enterprise what to do or how to do it. Um, this is just ensuring that complaint investigation data is shared consistently with the departments that are named in supporting this chapter. Um, I will recognize City Attorney Anderson. Uh, council President, con council members, my interpretation of this, this per data sharing provision is actually just, it's listing out the, the staff and offices that have access to data. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to access data. There's no provision saying that, that folks shall be copied or, or anything of that nature. It's simply a, really a finite list of data can only be shared with these certain offices or, or staff members. Um, and again, the city auditor's office does already have access to this data. Um, this is simply identifying that, that fact, that if that provides any clarity. Thank you, uh, Ms. Anderson. And um, I believe I saw Council Member Wansley in queue, but maybe you eliminated yourself. And um, so we have a motion before us offered by Council Member Chuck Tai. Um, is there any further discussion? Any none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vitoff. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries that amendment is adopted. Uh, Council Member Chuktai. Thank you. We're now moving on to amendment number four, which also um, addresses this uh, the same section that we were we were just talking about, 172.3C data sharing. Um, so this now adds that complaint investigation and discipline records anonymized sufficiently to prov to be provided consistent with Minnesota state statute section 13.43 and other other applicable law shall be shared with members of the Community Commission on Police Oversight. Um, the goal here is, um, is to make sure that information that can be, sh uh, actually I'm gonna step back for a second. I remember in our earlier briefings with, with civil rights when we first started talking about um, creating this new body uh, one of the one of the items that was brought to us by both the the city clerk and the civil rights director was that there's a silo that exists right now in our in our oversight function, where we have you know the PCOC and then we have the um, PCRP the police conduct review panels, um, and these panels are the ones uh, where we have members actually sitting in on complaint and receiving complaint investigations, um, receiving that full unrestricted, um, rep like receive, making recommendations to the chief of police on discipline. They have access to all of the information about what's actually going on and what's actually going wrong within the department. And the silo that exists between the review panels and the commission is a part of the problem we were trying to solve for with this ordinance. Now, making sure that members of the review panel come from this commission, that's one important step in addressing the core problem we were trying to solve for. The second step is making sure that as much of that data from these complaint investigations that we can share and do so in a responsible manner, we share with all members of the commission so that when they're making recommendations on policies, procedures, um, that that is informed by actual data and actual cases of you know, what's going on day to day. Um, that's what the intention of this amendment is, and I will move it for, for this body's approval. Thank you, Council Member Chugtai. Um, is there a motion, is there a second? 
Madam President, before there's a second, I just to clarify with everyone, this language that's before you in the Shugtai Amendment number four is almost verbatim already included in the base um, substitute that the president has moved and perhaps it was unclear that it was. Councilmember Payne had brought this forward as an amendment that was incorporated by the president under section 172.60. This is under the powers of the commission on the second to the last page. It's in red highlighting uh, in subsection I, paragraph one. And you'll see the underscoring says that the commission has the power uh, to request programs, research, and study from the Supervisor Department, including requesting complaint investigation discipline records anonymized sufficiently to be provided consistent with Minnesota statute section 13.43 and other applicable law. Um, and that information then would be shared with the community commission. This is their power. Um, so I think that the good news here is that the ability to get anim anonymized data around complaints, investigation, discipline, we've put into the base uh, proposal as a power of the commission. So if I, if I may, I appreciate the clarification. Um, we, the city attorney and I actually went back and forth uh, on, on this and the language that's used in this amendment was pulled from, um, from the Payne Amendment. What's different in the, in the section you're referring to where the commission has the power to request um, anonymized data on complaint investigations and this is that in this case, we are saying, in this amendment states that every complaint investigation that comes in as they are coming in and as they are being completed, that that information shall be shared with all members of the review panel and that the uh, anonymizing that data, making sure it's consistent with state data practices, that that work is, is done. So the, the point here is that with each investigation, all members of the commission have that information in front of them and they don't have to know to go back and request it from staff. Thank you, council member. Would that include uh, people who self opt out of um, uh, background check? I believe this is anonymized and um, it is, um, we, we ensure that we are, we are in compliance with both data practices and other applicable law for this exact reason. So the other applicable law would include CJIS certification as an example, I, I would presume. But the city attorney can correct me. Yes, uh, city attorney Anderson. Um, council president, council members, um, it, it Essentially, what would have to happen is that any, if there were members of the panel who had not taken and passed a background check, any CJIS data would actually have to be removed from the information that's that's given to them. Um, anything else would have to be anonymized, but I, that CJIS data, even an anonymization, wouldn't be sufficient. We'd have to pull it pull it from the packet, so to speak, that's gone to, that goes to those panel members, or I mean to the commission members. So for clarity, is there a conflict with this amendment and that interpretation? Uh, Council President, I don't think that there's a conflict. It's just go goes to staff to ensure that the information that's given to any council, uh, commission members who haven't taken and passed the background check have those pieces removed. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I also just want to know, uh, Council Member Chuck Ty, thank you for the addition to the language of just especially since we just passed the prior amendment of the inclusion of the city auditor's office. That is a new addendum to uh, the consensus amendment that we are all uh, referring to. And also how that then factors into a more, you know, thorough analysis that could be be provided to members of the panel. So I did just want to note that of like, we just passed the city auditor's amendment, that's factor into this too and kind of builds upon that. So thank you for that. All right, seeing no further discussion, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Wansley. Aye. Council member Johnson. Aye. Council member Osmond. Aye. Council member Payne. Aye. Council member Koski. Aye. Council member Shugtai. Aye. Council member Chavez. Aye. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. 
Councilmember Chuktai will introduce a motion number five. I see Councilmember Johnson in queue, so I will pause for oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. I, I just wanted to put out there publicly in a couple of minutes, I am gonna have to leave. I do have a sick kid that I need to take over uh, child care duties uh, for because we don't have anyone else that's able to. Um, and I'll, I'll just note too that, you know, in my nine years on the council, I don't remember another instance where we have taken up at a full city council meeting this many amendments on an ordinance. So. Um, I, you know, I expect this body is going to finish going through these amendments today, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that I hope this body would also consider a delay on uh, the overall ordinance just from a procedural justice standpoint for the public. I have had an opportunity to talk with the city attorney and colleagues to really understand the rationale behind trying to pass something today and while I understand that uh, it would be ideal uh, too for a couple of reasons, uh, I also don't think it's necessary personally, that's my opinion. And so I think in light of that, that's why I, I personally would feel more comfortable uh, if that's what this body did, but I, I also think that it makes sense to go through the amendments today and I, I won't be here unfortunately for that part of this, but I did uh, want to state that on the record. Thank you. Councilmember Chuck Tai. All right, we are now moving on to amendment number five, which addresses section 122.6I, um, in which the commission is empowered to make recommendations to the city council mayor and chief of police about its finding based upon programs of research and study. This is a more substantial change in which um, we are allowing the commission to make recommendations to the city council mayor and or chief of police relating to police department practices, internal controls, collective bargaining agreements and other related matters contained within a program of research and study. The commission may refer to the city attorney for consideration and recommendation any matter related to compliance with applicable law or regulation with respect to police policies and procedures. The point here is um, to, to name very explicitly the, the scope um, of, of work that this commission can make recommendations on. Um, and you know the, the piece that w when I started working on this amendment, I really deeply cared about was adding in um, their, their recommendations to collective bargaining agreements. I know that um, earlier this year, the, the, the council president and I worked on um, doing uh, community engagement sessions around the city on the, uh, the Police Federation contract. It was the first time that our city had ever done that. And overwhelmingly, what we saw members of the public share with us was a uh, hunger for more formalized ways of giving this type of feedback to us. When we allow this commission that is really seeing where things are going wrong and is really focused on oversight, um, they can help us strengthen the one of the tools of accountability that we have in the in the form of collective bargaining agreements as well as um, you know depart department practices, internal controls and, and other matters. Um, and so creating that structure and allowing for this commission to give recommendations on this issue um, I think is really important. And then beyond that, um, the commission referring to the city attorney for consideration and recommendation any matter related to compliance with applicable law. We know that the city attorney's office is the only um, body that's, that has the, um, the charter given authority to um, state legal opinions um, for anyone within this enterprise. And so we didn't want this commission to make um, recommendations around compliance with other relevant laws. We wanted that to be vetted actually through the city attorney um, who could then make that recommendation. I will move this amendment for approval. 
Second. Uh, is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Um, Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Is that Councilmember Vita? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what what happened? We're voting We're on voting. the amendment. Oh, yes. The the last one that Councilmember Chuck Ty was just talking. Aye. Councilmember Randall. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries that amendment is adopted. Amendment number six offered by Councilmember Chuck Ty. All right, amendment number six uh, is referring to section 172.4 um, for A, the review panel procedure, um, which, which talks about the, the review panels that um, oversee each complaint investigation composed of five members, um, two of these being sworn officers of holding the rank of lieutenant or higher, um, and then three being civilians um, from the Community Commission on Police Oversight. This instead makes the change to each um, review panel being composed of five members uh, selected from the Community Commission on Police Oversight um, and all being civilians and not um, current or former peace officers, part-time peace officers, or reserve officers as defined by um, Minnesota State Statute. Um, the, the point here being, um, you know, I was really called back to um, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights um, investigation report. And in it, there is a large section that's actually devoted to um, an assessment on each of the existing uh, mechanisms of oversight and discipline um, within the police department. So it talks about internal affairs, talks about HR, talks about OPCR, um, PCRP, all of these things. And one of the, its biggest um, criticisms or conclusions is that the, the, the form of civilian oversight, um, the OPCR and, and the PCOC and um, oversight, yeah, the, the, the form of civilian oversight that exists right now are not independent enough from the police department and that results in um, discipline not happening for misconduct. And it, I, you know, I really interpreted that as there, we have a deep need for us to have oversight that is as independent as, as we can make it within the current constraints that exist. There are internal controls that, that will exist before and after um, for, for police officers and for the police department to be able to handle discipline. That's what the whole point of internal affairs is. Um, and making sure that these review panels consist of civilians and are as independent from the police department, which this investigation tells us is what's needed, um, is really important. Um, and with that, I will move this um, amendment for approval. Council Member um, Chuck Tai has moved the amendment. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Council Member Osmond. Thank you, Madam President. I um, really hear uh, Council. I remember Chuck Tai's uh, argument. I don't know. Uh, for me, feel like uh, excluding uh, the police leadership uh, uh, might not be helpful in a way. I feel like they could be helpful uh, um, because what we're talking about, and especially having a recommendation, um, you know, this kind of puts puts us versus them type of way. You know, when you go sit down with the front of the 
public safety commissioner or the chief, uh, you know, this review panel recommendation only will consist on the public. But you know, in my in my understanding, I, I feel like they could they could be helpful, especially having a, a MPD leadership, uh, two of them in that uh, in that panel. They, if at the end of the day, that I believe the real change will have to come from the MPD leadership. Um, will have to come from the state and the federal. Um, what we're doing right now, it's a start, but it's nothing but a recommendation. Um, and I would say that for me, if we're trying to find a solution to the issue of police misconduct, police mistreatment for minority communities, um, uh, we have to include the city leadership and the police leadership to help us achieve those goals. Thank you. And I inadvertently skipped over Councilmember Vital. Councilmember Vital, please. Today is not my day, Madam President. No. I, it's <laughs> my fault, and I completely no take worries. responsibility. My I apologies. just had a question. So, a council member, Chuck Tai, this amendment is asking that the officers who sit on the panel are ranked lieutenant or higher. Correct. The. Uh, Council Member Vita, um, they currently are. That is they what currently the, are, right? Yeah. A lieutenant. So who's higher? So there's lieutenant, and then what goes up higher from lieutenant? I, I'm sorry. So the actual ordinance itself right now reads that two of the panelists are sworn members of the officer, uh, of, the, of the police department. My amendment is saying that all five members should be um should be yeah. civilians oh yeah all five sh okay <clears throat> yep okay got it i think i may have the wrong information here okay thank you uh council member wamsley thank you madam president um in response to uh some of the concerns raised by council member osman in regards to um not having representation by law enforcement on this panel i do want to refer back to actually a powerful um you know uh, reference that council president even made earlier um in our amendment session um where she shared the recommendations from the national association for civilian oversight of law enforcement where they even named community oversight pays the role to accountability, police accountability, and they advocate also for civilianized representation, majority civilianized represent representation on local boards like what we're considering today. So this is a recommendation that's fully in line with even the national kind of association that provides recommendations about how to structure um, boards like this, CCPO, in a way that actually encourages uh, trust uh, between the public, the city, and the police, um, but also that strengthens and empowers civilians uh, to have um, real meaningful influence in this process too in um, rendering uh, oversight over our police. So I just want to name that and also thank Council President uh, Jenkins for raising this earlier um, and again, see this as a baseline for uh, the, the intentions of, of Council Member Chug Tai in bringing this amendment forward. Thank you, uh, Council Member Wansley. And before I call on Council Member Palmasano, I will just restate what I iterated earlier um, from the from NACAL. They say that um, the key is to have a process be led by a majority of civilians that ensures there isn't in any way in which law enforcement has a greater say in the oversight process itself. So just clarifying what, what I shared, I, I, I don't think they really make a recommendation in any way or another. Um, they offer their um, insights and opinions. Um, and I took that into consideration and, and offer 
um, that there will be a majority of civilians on those um, panels, uh, which is included in the original ordinance. Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. It is that amendment that weighs it more to civilians that I think is the appropriate step to make here. Um, I wouldn't build a house without consulting an engineer. That's what would help me understand how to make it stand up. Um, I was surprised to see in the Tableau documentation that's publicly available that less than 4% uh, of the time does our current OPCR panel even have split decisions in the last six years. And currently, those are th those panels are two civilians and two sworn, if I'm not mistaken. They are. I'm getting confirmation from staff. So less than 4% of the time is there even a split vote. And on those split votes, it is not um, it, it is not shown the delineation of were those two sworn versus two civilian or was it one of each in that split decision. It just simply says there was a split decision. Um, I, before I was a council member, had an opportunity to participate on Citizens League panels. And a rule of thumb, and one that I think everybody here believes in on this body, is that in everything else we say that those impacted by the decision need to be involved. It does not mean they need to have the upper hand, but it means they need to be involved in crafting that. We say that about community all the time. It is one of the tenets of what we do here. So if that's the premise we use for everything, then how are we building trust with police if they're excluded from this accountability process? I think that is a step too far. <coughs> Council President Jenkins, as we rebuild trust in police and community relations, I think it's a reasonable request that Councilmember Chuck Tai is making. There's a reason why there's barely discipline within our police department as of today. Police investigating police, friends investigating friends can lead to a flawed process. This should be civilian led so our constituents can actually trust this process. I think we can certainly add police once we actually do reform the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Council Member Chuck Tai, I voted for every one of your amendments. I thought they were well thought, thought out. However, with this one, I, I agree with Council Member Osmond and Council Member Paul Masano. You have to have the police to build the trust, to fix the problem. You have to have everybody at the table. And that's been my life experience, and so I will not be voting for this amendment. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the discussion here today as we wrap up discussion um, and move into voting on this amendment. Um, I, you know, I want to come back to a, a couple of points that feel really important. Um, ultimately, review panels make a recommendation that goes to the chief of police. At the end of the day, the chief of police is the one who's making the final decision on whether that recommendation is, um, is, is upheld or not. And so ultimately, law enforcement is making the decision on whether discipline is warranted and what that discipline looks like. And the upper hand, right, at, at the conclusion of this process still rests with um, senior leadership within the, the police department. What I am, what I, the problem I'm trying to solve for is our like Minnesota Department of Human Rights investigation telling us no meaningful independent review process exists for assessing MPD officers content, con conduct as described in more detail below. In practice, OPCR and internal affairs are not distinct from one another and almost every investigation of a police misconduct complaint against an MPD officer, no matter how pre preliminary, is addressed or guided by sworn MPD officers. This is about asserting independence from that process and having there be a purpose to these review panels that's different from, um, from internal affairs, which is all um, members of the, of the police department. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Aye. Oh, 
Council member Wong. Aye. Council member Osman. No. Council member Payne. Aye. Council member Koski. No. Council member Shugtai. Aye. Council member Chavez. Aye. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Vita. No. Council member Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and six nays. That amendment fails, and we are moving to the next amendment offered by Councilmember Chuck Tai. All right, this is the final amendment um, that, that I'm bringing for this body's consideration. This addresses the very last section of this ordinance, section 172.7, around effective date and implementation. Um, and it changes the, the, the language as written in which this chapter becomes effective 120 days after uh, publication, um, except section 172.8, which is repealed immediately, and then it also allows staff um, to, to take next steps on implementation of this, this full chapter. Um, my amendment um, keeps the 120 day period for implementation of this chapter and could still allow staff to take appropriate next steps in facilitating recruitment, appointment, and training of members of the commission prior to this effective date. Um, but it instead says that upon this chapter becoming effective, 172.8 is going to be repealed. So for context, section 172.8 is what creates the PCOC, the police, um, or the, the, yes, the PCOC. Um, when we, and I understand that we need time to implement this, this, um, this chapter, and I don't wanna set deadlines, right? I don't wanna say 30 days, 60 days, whatever, that we are gonna end up missing later. That's, it's really important for us to get this right. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. What I disagree with is we are creating a new form of community oversight of our, of our police department. And we've seen a lot of criticism, particularly from um, members of our community and members who have or have had in the past roles with the, with the PCOC. And then what we're doing is we're saying, hey, for the next 120 days, so that gets us probably through April, right? We are gonna have no form of community oversight of the police department. And it's the, the time in the interim where we have nothing while we wait for something that concerns me. And I think in this moment with an issue as sensitive as this one, removing communities removing community input and any formalized way in which we gather that input and empower community to have their voice heard on this issue is a problem. And I understand that in the future, the, the, the PCOC won't exist and it, it does make sense for us to repeal it once the, the new chapter is implemented. Um, and so, lining up those two dates so that we don't have that 120 day interim period where we've got no form of community oversight is really important. With that, I will move this amendment for approval. Councilmember uh, Chuck Tai has moved uh, amendment number seven for approval. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? Uh, Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also have to speak against this amendment. I am, I am glad that Council Member Chug Tai and I are on the same page about needing some time to ramp up. Um, there is a later amendment by Council Member Wansley that would decrease that ramp up time by 75%. So I'm we do agree on that portion of your amendment. Um, but I don't think, I do think the way staff originally put this draft together makes the most sense. Um, and that would be that city staff should spend their time in this next 120 days in helping us to post these appointments, to interview for these appointments, allow our city council to then make important careful approvals for these appointments and then have NACOL in and all of the training that we will 
be giving to these new um, commissioners to set them up for success. What I do not want us to be beholden to anymore is the need to go and do that for a PCOC that would be essentially defunct as soon as this takes um, effect in 120 days. So that's why I won't be able to support this amendment. I appreciate the, um, the desire to not let go of something till we have something else, but in this case, this would be a very lame duck type of commission and it would be in such short order, we wouldn't even be able to make those appointments um, essentially until we'd be making the ones for the, for the new one. So that's my rationale, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Chavez. Uh, I'll be supporting this amendment. Just, it's pretty simple. I think that we need to be able to have a police accountability method to be able to, to make recommendations on discipline. And by not doing this amendment, I think it puts us in a very dangerous situation where we're gonna go months without a discipline process for police officers in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Mm, absent. Council Member Osmond. No. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Nay. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Allison. No. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are three ayes, seven nays, and two absent. One abstention to, I'm sorry, Council Member Wansley. That amendment fails. And now, colleagues, we are moving to the amendments offered by Council Member Wansley. And I will call on Council Member Wansley to introduce those amendments. Thank you, Madam President. Home stretch here. All right. So. Uh, first uh, motion is to amend uh, section 172.40 um, around panel recommendations and civil service rules. So essentially codifying civil service rules into this commission will help strengthen accountability by ensuring that you know panel recommendations are consistent in the way that the city uses discipline with all employees who work at um, the city of Minneapolis. Also the MDHR noted that there was a severe disconnect on how discipline was used by MPD and the standardizing of language between MPD and the commission and it has created a lot of confusion, a lot of issues with that low percentage of, of discipline that the former PCOP uh, actually rendered. So by actually using the civil service rules, we'll be not only standardizing this process, but creating a level of consistency that this commission needs. Um, and once again, you know, I want to highlight the MDHR report even took issues with this practice um, and noted that MPD used workarounds to avoid accountability by using, you know, terms like coaching, which we had a thorough presentation on just this past August uh, with public safety uh, experts, Professor Rachel Moran and also the former uh, PCO, um, sorry, PCLC uh, chair, uh, Abigail Sarah, um, where, you know, they highlighted, again, coaching being used as this, this avoided kind of practice for discipline. So this amendment, amendment would basically provide parameters how we should be disciplining employees who engage in misconduct, um, and again, provide that consistency that is needed. Um, I also want to note, you know, throughout this year, I've been a vocal proponent of standardization of our policies, and there are so many ways in which MPD operates completely outside of the standards that we hold every other city employee and city department to. Um, and I think we will all agree that MPD is not above the law, and they are not above city policy. So by basing the CCPO on the same civil uh, service rules that govern every other city employee, um, that will help remove MPD from the island that I think we're trying to, you know, discontinue from happening as we move forward to a more comprehensive public safety service. So with that, I will move this item for consideration. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I won't be able to support this amendment today and it's and here's what I agree with about it. I absolutely agree, and we all clearly recognize gaps in discipline in the past in our department, and I am 
not arguing that doing something towards civil service rules wouldn't be equitable, it would be. Um, MPD absolutely needs to get on board with equitable and consistent discipline. MPD also is the only body where we have a civilian oversight commission to recommend merit or no merit for misconduct. And I have come to appreciate in speaking with employment types of attorneys on this that this would be especially problematic should a chief ever decide to make the decision to go above any sort of recommended discipline from a panel. Now, people might think that would be quite unusual, um, but I'm not sure that, th that it necessarily is. Um, I'm curious if the city attorney would be willing to speak a little bit to the risk of having um, an employment recommendation for discipline made in public and then what that does in terms of what the supervisor, in this case the chief's ultimate recommendation is. Um, uh, council President, Council Vice President, um, I, I guess maybe I'll make two points. One, as I understand the current system, while the panels recommend merit or no merit, they don't currently recommend disciplinary action, so this would be a departure. Um, I certainly have seen in the past and in, in my employment law career uh, when dis, you know a decision making or a recommendation body uh, recommends suspension, for example, and then the hiring manager decides, no, this is more significant conduct. Um, I'm going to impose a discharge. Then we obviously go to an arbitration, and the fact that the panel had recommended a lower level of discipline is is definitely used against the employer uh, as sort of evidence that there wasn't just cause for the higher level of discipline. So, so that would be a risk. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? I'm sorry, Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to note, you know, I'm glad that uh, Council Vice President um, sought out advice from employment attorneys. Um, I sought out advice from the MDHR that explicitly named this as a, a clear issue in terms of lack of standardization between discipline and the type of recommendations, those metrics that you referred to, and then what's actually um, being delivered in, in, in disciplined action. So this actually creates more clarity and parity between those things by standardizing what we already use to govern all of our city employees, what ideally the chief should also be using, it helps codify that instead of, you know, deferring to an employment attorney in different sectors that might not be relevant because those sectors are currently not under a consent decree. Um, I will also note, this will help with arbitration process, which the MDR or MDHR report constantly highlights how we have failed to actually do standardized discipline amongst our officers. And that is why arbitration tends to go against us uh, because we failed to hit all the check box. We failed to actually have a standardized process. We engage in this arbitrary enforcement of discipline depending on the officers. So this again will allow for a standardization so we can bring stronger cases to arbitration that could then successfully pass that phase. So again, hitting those check box. And also I would love to see the percentage or reports where across the country, where are we really seeing civilians, like majority civilian oversight bodies, actually giving lower census or discipline to officers that are documented in having misconduct. I absolutely do not believe that's a, a popular or a trend um, that actually our council just noticed. So if there's data that approves that, we'd love to see that, but I, I'm very concerned that that's actually a, a thing that's grounded in reality, and I'm pretty sure our civilians are more than willing and more than ready to hold officers accountable using these civil service rules to administer actual standardized discipline that we administer to all of our city employees. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Councilmember Wanzi actually touched on the point I wanted to make, but I'm going to make my point regardless just to emphasize that uh, we're going to get hurt in arbitration when we can't pass the seven tests of just cause when we uh, discipline. And one of those tests is prior enforcement. And I'm just going to read it. An employer may not be penalized for violating a rule or standard that the employer has failed to enforce for a prolonged period. So we're talking about this hypothetical scenario of um, uh, the commission making a recommendation for discipline and the, and the chief going above that. 
that's like a hypothetical. It would be nice to have some real world data. Nobody's going to Google that right now. I don't think we need to Google that right now. Um, because we already have the real world data of losing arbitration cases because there's clear demonstration that we don't consistently enforce our rules and policies and the discipline or lack thereof reflects that. So I think the bigger legal risk we have is the lack of clarity that I think this amendment actually helps solve for. Any further discussion? Colleague, I mean, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are seven ayes and four nays. Uh, carries that amendment is adopted. Uh, the next amendment, number two, is being offered by Councilmember Wansley. Ooh, don't sound so tired, Madam President. We're almost there. We're almost there. I, I am very, <laughs> I'm very tired. I know, we are. <laughs> We're almost there. All right. So, second one. Uh, this is amending uh, 172. 0.50B around disciplinary decisions um, in 30 days, again, pursuant to the civil service rules. Um, this is an amendment that is definitely in response to the community input that we received, you know, once this ordinance became public, specifically, you know, from former PCOC commissioners who have spent several months now explaining what is needed for this commission to be a credible body that's capable of oversight and accountability. Um, I also know that both the public as well as the council is aware of how MPD exploited the term coaching once again to avoid accountability to officers who were engaging in bad and violent and racist behavior. These officers were able to escape any public scrutiny because their supervisors and MPD leadership allow coaching to be the cloak against accountability. So this amendment assures that any sustained misconduct from MPD officers results in a response that is once again pursuant to the civil service rules. These rules also again govern all of our city employees and are actually created by an independent body to ensure parity amongst all of our city workers. So by linking sustained misconduct to these rules, we are again just, you know, building that, that reinforcement wall that no workarounds will happen when it comes to accountability, which unfortunately those workarounds is what allow MPD officer Derek Chauvin to stay on the force um, in the first place years before uh, he murdered George Floyd. So, you know, we know this lack of accountability and transparency is what has allowed not only officers like Chauvin, but so many other officers to receive hundreds of thousands of dollars in payouts just this year alone, um, even though they committed egregious acts of violence against our residents. So discipline in MPD is, is def desperately needed when it comes to this aspect, and again, linking it to the civil service rules helps establish a clear and transparent standard. So with that, I will move this item for consideration. Thank you. Councilmember Wansley, is there a second? Again. Uh, is there any discussion? Mm. Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam President. I just briefly would like to ask if the city attorney wanted to comment on the legality of this. I think that there is some, there's just some challenges here, but I would defer to anything she might have to offer on this one. City Attorney Anderson. Um, uh, Council President, Council Vice President. Um, the, the way it's written and the way that I construe it, it does not require disciplinary action. We couldn't do that under state law. Um, it is the chief and only the chief who has the ultimate decision-making authority about whether discipline uh, is or isn't merited. So this does not supersede the chief's responsibility, again, guaranteed under state law. Um, this simply means that if there is, if the chief decides to render discipline, then it has to be consistent with the civil service rules, uh, except as um, might be inconsistent with the collective bargaining agreement. The collective bargaining agreement does trump the civil service rules if there's a conflict, and then obviously uh, a catch-all that that the decision has to be consistent with with all applicable law. So, with that understanding, I I don't have a concern. <laughs> Mr. 
to the attorney. Is there any further um, discussion? Councilmember Chavez, are you in queue? I am not council president. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vital. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are nine ayes and two nays. That amendment is adopted. Next is a motion to amend offered by Councilmember Wansley. All right, amendment number three. Uh, so we are amending uh, sections 172, 6. Uh, 60, um, subsection two. So this is in regards to frequency of meetings and basically my amendment changes it from four to eight. Um, I wanna note again, this is absolutely in response to community feedback where you know folks really commented um, with their uh, dissatisfaction with the frequency of meetings that's currently included in this ordinance. You know, while I'm aware that this body came together to vote on, uh, that this body can come together to vote on whether or not they'll have more meetings, I believe the fact that, you know, we're about to enter into two consent decrees uh, that, you know, this commission will be incredibly busy for the next several years. So I propose a minimum of eight meetings so that when applicants apply, they are fully aware of the time commitment that they're signing up uh, for in order to be part of this, you know, critical work of the commission. Um, and we want to absolutely be transparent about the type of workload that is gonna be required of this commission. And I believe, you know, having four meetings with, uh, you know, vagueness is actually unfair to people who are really trying to make informed decisions around if they're gonna have the capacity to be fully involved on this board. So, you know, we're gonna be asking this body to make recommendations to the mayor, to city council, to the public about a, a wide range of issues involving police policies um, and, and so many more uh, other aspects too that will largely be shaped by the MDHR report and consent decree as well as the DOJ findings. So there's gonna be a lot of work ahead for this body to consider. And this amendment essentially reflects the very minimum um, that, you know, this body will take up just in the year ahead. So with that, I move this for consideration. Councilmember Wansley has moved uh, this amendment. Is there a second? Second. Uh, is there any discussion, Councilmember Osman? Um, doing the math here, it's three every three months there will be a meeting. Um, if it's eight times, is that correct? Am I? I'm not strong. How how often it will that be? A couple months a meeting. If it was eight, it would be essentially every three months. Every three months, there's four meetings a year. Four meetings a year. But Councilmember Wansley wants eight times a year, every six weeks. Okay, so this is a voluntary um, uh, job for uh, for the folks that are doing. Um, I think, of course, you know, highlighting that on the application uh, could be. Um, could be clear for them to, to make that commitment. Um, I have a question with for um, city clerk, and I'm, I'm not comparing the commission. You know, the, the committee is here. I know this committee is, is very important and has a real actual um, thing that it wants to achieve, but what is the schedule for, for example, I don't know, um, other committees that we have uh, how often do they meet a year? Through the chair, Councilmember Osman, uh, it varies based on uh, the different boards and commissions. Typically, I will say the majority of our boards <clears throat> conduct regular meetings monthly. Um, so it's usually a monthly meeting, not always, but usually a monthly meeting. I will add that the reason that the staff said a minimum, a floor of four, was because in the past we had two separate bodies. We had the Police Conduct Oversight Commission, the PCOC, and we had the review panels. They were separate, they had separate members, they did separate functions. The amendment to create the CCPO combines them. And so in addition to public meetings, the members of the CCPO will be expected to do service on those panels. And so in order to you know, manage their time better, 
it was seen as you'll have at least four regular meetings. You can always call additional special meetings like any of our boards can as long as you give the statutory notice um, so that the public is informed you're adding meetings to the calendar. Uh, and then in addition, you have to do this work that is on the review panels. So it was in recognition that these members, uh, a smaller pool of people are doing double duty. But that was the reason for the proposed change. Um, my understanding, and I think Council uh, Member Vita said that this would uh, make the regular meetings, the amendment Council Member Wands has put forward, um, about more than once a month. So every, what, six or eight weeks is going to be some months you'll have two regular meetings, some you'll only have one. Just depends on the, the cycle of how those go. But it would be closer to what is today, where they have monthly meetings rather than uh, only four as a minimum. Thank you. Yeah, and I did put myself in queue. You know, I, I just get concerned about the, um, the challenge we have appointing people to boards and commissions, uh, particularly this one. And, um, you know, I, I really appreciate the, I, the intent of transparency of the workload. I, I certainly think we can do that um, because this commission may not require eight meetings a month. I, I think they should determine that as a autonomous independent body, um, the amount of time that they need to meet to, to do the business of this commission. Um, Council Member Wanzo. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanna start off with uh, just noting that once again, this board is not like any other board at the city just on the basis of no other board is gonna to have to be weighing uh, results from a consent decree coming from the state as well as uh, am coming consent decree coming from the Department of Justice. So once again, the idea that, you know, the same type of level of, of frequency that many of our other boards and commissions uh, currently operate under is gonna be on par with this commission. In reality, that's just simply not about to be true. Um, I also want to just provide some clarification of, you know, we've never had an issue with recruitment around the PCOC. It was council in prep for this, this creation of this uh, that we did not make appointments to it and let it become defunct, and which has now led us into a lawsuit around this. So I do want to note, like, there is going to be a number of civilians that are really excited to be part of this board, especially if it's credible, um, and that they should absolutely have um, an accurate, uh, you know, presentation around this workload that they're about to walk into with, again, the guise of two consent decrees and the recommendations that's going to be coming from that um, as they make policies for us to consider as council, for the mayor to consider, and ultimately for the police chief to consider. So that is the reality of the situation. This amendment reflects that reality, and we'll love to have y'all support on it. If not, cool, but we could move forward uh, to, to be, you know, considered. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. And I, I really try to refrain from back and forth, but I, I will note that we, we already determined we have never removed anybody from a board or commission, particularly this one. So people resign for a variety of reasons. They didn't think it was effective enough. They had a baby, whatever the reasons is, they resigned. So people left the committee. It's not that we just didn't appoint people. That being said, um, there's no further discussion. Are you in queue, Council Member? Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Kosky. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Mm. I'm sorry, was that an aye? aye sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Ellis. Aye. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are eight ayes and three nays. That amendment carries, and that is adopted. The next amendment will be offered by Council Member Wansley. 
Thank you, Madam President. So this one is amending section 172.60 uh, subsection I. Um, and this is related to complaints and whistleblower protections. You know, another aspect of this ordinance that was flagged by the public was that there was no language about how the complaint process will work. You know, even at the public hearing, it was noted that those who have filed uh, complaints against MPD officers experienced retaliation. And, you know, these complainants were even minors. We heard from uh, uh, former minors of our career sports uh, program, that's a program of MPD who engaged in this, they face retaliation. So, you know, we want to set a precedence with this new commission that, you know, there should not be any type of retaliation happening. And including this language in section six allows this commission to work with each other and staff who are not only experts in data practices, but to also formalize a process that ensures protections for residents and it's accessible to the public to know that if they make a complaint, there are protections in place to ensure their safety. Um, I also want to note that section, say, section 7 was also put in place to grant protections to MPD officers who also reported disturbing behavior and misconduct. Um, there, you know, as documented in the NDHR report, uh, there's been a documented history of MPD officers who also have faced retaliation from their peers for speaking up about bad behavior. Um, and ultimately, you know, this type of culture even led to those officers being pushed out of MPD for crossing the quote unquote thin blue line. Um, in fact, I hope many of my, many of my colleagues are, are um, already familiar with this story, but if not, I encourage you to look up um, and read about the lived experience of former MPD officer Colleen Ryan, who experienced this retaliatory culture themselves, and that was documented by local and national media. So, you know, I want to acknowledge that there's um, that in the consensus ordinance too that we just passed, we did approve language that prohibits retaliation, which you know came from uh, my office conversations with our city attorneys and. You know, I appreciate the inclusion, but I'm also bringing forward this amendment because it's actually stronger than what's included in the consensus document. And my amendment empowers the commission to work with staff to establish the protections that's needed so that they're not just written on paper without any type of enforcement. And also it adds transparency. And I think without those additions, you know, I don't believe we are going to be de demonstrating a real commitment to protecting both residents and officers who come forward with the complaint. So with that, I move this for consideration. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Can you just identify what those uh, specific provisions are? You want me to read the amendment language publicly then? No, you, you said that this was stronger than the already included language that you offered. Um, and so I'm, I'm having a problem understanding what's what's the um, significant difference? The difference, if you look on the consensus um, document that, again, that was included, it says, you know, prohibition of retaliation against community members, uh, that's, that's in here. Again- More city employees, including police officers, which you reference, who submit complaints, provide information related to police misconduct, right. or assist otherwise. Right, and then my proposal says, for six, amend that section to say recommend clear, detailed process for complaint investigations and other necessary policies that build in safeguards against community members who are vulnerable to retaliation. Point seven then says, which will be an addition, um, recommend policies that protect against retaliation also for police officers who may fall under the category of whistleblowers or are vulnerable to retaliation. So again, it provides more clarification to that section. It helps strengthen enforcement mechanisms around it. Thank you, uh, Council Member, and, and I do appreciate your initial um, amendment, and um, thank you for strengthening it. Council Member Promisano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we all want the most robust kind of language in here as possible. Um, I have a question again for the city attorney that is, is it the right place to put it in here where we have, where it exists today in what's been amended is under complaint filing, which seems to make sense to me. Councilmember Wansley's proposal suggests that we include it under the powers section 
And I believe that something like whistleblower law is it's state law. That's not something that we can have a civilian commission do or take on. Um, so could you weigh in on where it should be appropriately vested and then if we can effectuate that whistleblower section into here legally? Um, the council president, council vice president. So, so uh, what we do in the consensus document, um, in the complaint filing and resolution process, we have a directive to, um, to city staff, MPD, civil rights to adopt policies. And among those policies in the consensus document, we drafted a, a requirement to adopt essentially an anti-retaliation policy. We don't use the term whistleblower because whistleblower is actually a term of art defined in state law. And many of these complaints don't necessarily, are, are not necessarily complaints of the violation of law. So we don't, we don't wanna just limit this to whistleblowers as it would be defined in state law. This, the, the way that the consensus document was written was intended to be broader to really catch, you know, to create a, a policy that applies to all complainants, all folks who participate in investigations, uh, you know, whether again it's civilians, other employees, uh, peace officers, and give them just general anti-retaliation protection, whether their complaint does or doesn't rise to the level of whistleblower protection or not. So that was really the intention of, of putting that um, item in the uh, policies and procedures that staff would have to um, uh, adopt. Um, you know, I, I think council member Wansley, and, and I don't mean to speak for you, but I, what, what you're looking at here is, is then also giving some authority to the commission to make recommendations about those types of policies. You know, again, I think that having that broader, getting away from the term whistleblower and having that broader, broader anti-retaliation language is, I think, preferable, um, but that to me, that's sort of the distinction that, that the consensus document really is, is a directive to staff who is going to be responsible for actually adopting the policies um, to adopt that anti-retaliation policy. So I, I don't know if that answers anybody's question. Uh, I'm sorry, did you address the um, uh, question about placement within the ordinance language? Um, maybe I didn't, but... I think that it it absolutely does belong in the consensus document in that directive to staff to adopt policies that that is the staff's requirement to adopt policies. I would not take it out of that. Yeah. Um, no, you, I I thought the question was should it be under section 172.60 I or Complaint filing and resolution um, section number 172.30, number six. Yes, and I think it should definitely be in 172.30. That is absolutely the appropriate place because, again, staff is going to be promulgating these policies. Um, if uh, Council Member Wansley also wants something in the powers of the, the body to make recommendations about those policies, you know, it, as long as they're just recommendations, the c commission can't actually adopt the policies, but if they're gonna make recommendations, they can make recommendations to staff about what those policies might contain. So Madam Chair, with that explanation, I think that keeping it the way that it is in the consensus document helps it be broad and strong and would apply to more people. Um, and that's just what I wanna say about that. Thank you, and moving it to, I mean, passing the amendment offered by Council Member Wansley would then um, further um, I guess uh, allow the CCPO to make additional policy recommendations, yeah. which we already passed that they could do that earlier. But I mean, if we wanna um, 
identify this particular policy making, I think it's fine. Um, Council Member Wansley. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Again, this doesn't strip anything from that section. I think the city attorney clarified that. I hope for you, uh, Council Vice President Palmasano, if anything, it reflects, again, additional power, and that's why we put in there in Section 6 that ability for the CCPO to make those recommendations, um, which I think you also shared. Again, like that is fully within the wheelhouse of the CCPO, too. So just having that be codified in the consensus uh, ordinance as well. Wonderful. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are seven ayes and four nays. That amendment is adopted, and we have amendment number five offered by Council Member Wanzel. Thank you, Madam President. So this is amending 172.60 section E. This is around removal and ensuring accountability with vacated seats. We so much touched on this. You know, I brought forth this amendment again in response to community concerns that appointments could be shortened uh, for unclear reason. And this language is meant to assuage the fears of residents that their actions on the commission could result in them being removed and to ensure that anyone who's willing to commit to being on the CCPO will finish their term without fear of political backlash from their appointing body, either that being the council or the mayor. Um, the mayor, uh, the reasons for removal for these seats should be aligned with how we run our other boards and commissions. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so, you know, I know that was a concern brought up with council member Payne's um, amendment, and I'm hoping this helps build uh, on that, that discussion, uh, while also continuing to leave this power with council because of past practice. And also this language is meant to reinforce the standards that we currently have for all appointees. Um, this amendment will also require that we fill the seat within 60 days. This ensures that we are actively recruiting and promoting open seats. And when they are not filled, we will promptly inform the public of the reasons why. Um, I believe the additional language will help us towards this goal of, of building back trust with the public as it will show that we have learned the mistakes that we made as it relates to communication about past PCLC seats. So with that, I will move this item for consideration. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Say none, clerk, please. Sorry, I spelled my name wrong in the chat. I was going so fast. Councilmember Pita. Thank you, Madam President. I was just wondering if this um, conflicts with some of the other provisions that we've already approved. Um, do you want to address that, Councilmember Wansley? I would love if Councilmember Vita could. I, from my understanding. We did not move forward with Council Member uh, Payne's uh, amendment for removal, so we have not considered anything around removals yet, and this will be an additional amendment for us that somewhat provide clarification around that process. I, I think I'm speaking more to the um, uh, Council President Jenkins. I'll ask the clerk or the city attorney yeah. to please weigh in on that. Mr. Clerk. Uh, to, to the president, to Councilmember Vita, I think there's, there was a very, very lengthy discussion, you'll recall, about appointments, the process of removing, whether or not we've ever removed anyone, and what the process would be to remove someone. The current consensus document shows that members who are appointed serve at the pleasure of the appointing authority and would be removed by the appointing authority. Um, there was a proposal by Councilmember Payne, I believe, to change that. Um, that extensive discussion um, resulted in a vote that that proposed amendment didn't pass. This amendment raises the issue of removal uh, and provides that members don't serve at the pleasure of the appointing authority. They serve for a defined term uh, unless the seat's vacated for resignation, death, or removal. Um, not sure how uh, individuals would be removed. The seat is then filled for the balance and must be done within 60 days or a public announcement um, made 
that talks about the measures being implemented to ensure why why the seat is vacant and what's being done to fill it. Did I capture Councilmember Wansley your intent? Question, Councilmember Vita? Yeah, yes. Uh, Councilmember, Council Vice President Promisano. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Chair. I think what that says to me is that we should probably keep it consistent with the way that we do things so that when we figure out how we have some regular consideration process or grievance process or removal process that it's consistent amongst all bodies. Um, and I'm not sure that we would ever, we've ever had a place or a way to provide reasoning on why the seat is vacant and what measures are being implemented. I'm not sure where that would be posted. I guess it could be posted on the website, but it seems like that could, it, it would be very unusual to try and do that for this body. So I, I would recommend against this one. Uh, City Attorney <coughs> Anderson. Uh, council President, uh, members of the council, uh, just back to the question about, about conflict. Um, what I see in the, the consensus ordinance is an E for removal and then an F for vacancies. So if uh, Council Member Wansley's amendment were to pass, um, it would be in conflict with uh, F vacancies. Uh, in the consensus document, it simply says that the uh, seat shall be filled for the balance of the un unexpired term by the appointing authority. Council Member Wansley's uh, amendment would have a 60 day mm -hmm. requirement. Um, so there would have to be some sort of uh, reconciliation done between if uh, Council Member Wansley's uh, amendment passes as E, um, then I would recommend that we, the, we strike F. So there's no conflict internally. I'm sorry, which section are you referring to? 72, 172.60? 172.60 uh, uh, E and F are, are what we're discussing. All right. Um, so, according to the city attorney, there would be conflict with the proposed um, consensus document and the Wansley Amendment if it prevails. Um, Councilmember Wansley, do you have a recommendation for reconciling that? Um, I have a recommendation to amend Section E um, to what I've proposed to replace what's in the consensus document. Um, and I was in queue, so I just did want to offer some feedback to uh, in regards to Council Vice President's comments around standardization. Um, that's why we talked about removal. Nothing about my amendment comes in conflict with a standardized practice. In fact, it actually builds upon that by allowing council to continue to be kind of the guiding appointing process. So there's actually not a difference in that piece, but what is being moved before you is for this amendment to replace uh, the vacancies piece in our consensus document. Madam President, Councilmember Wansley, I think maybe one thing you might consider is the attorney has said that your proposed E conflicts with what's in the consensus document F. So mm -hmm. one thing you might consider is adding a strike of letter F, of subsection Thank F. So if E passes, it would also include a strike of F. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, whatever you just said, Clark Carl. <laughs> So for the body, just can we can we just, just I'll reiterate uh, that in the that, chat or so if that the proposal. if that makes sense, then if if the proposed amendment from Councilmember Wansley passes, if you're looking at the consent document on page one, two, three, four, halfway down, letter E says removal. 
The following subsection F says vacancies. The attorney has called out that there's a conflict between um, the proposed new letter E that Wansley has moved and what's existing F vacancies. So I think what we would do with Councilmember Wansley's proposal is add to that that if E passes, if this proposal passes, it also includes striking all of F vacancies and then relettering from there down. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, and <coughs> Councilmember Wansley, you are uh, amenable to that change? Yes. Colleagues, we have before us Councilmember Wansley's um, amendment. Um, is there any further discussion? Is there any further discussion? Um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and six nays. That uh, amendment fails, and we move to the last amendment offered by Councilmember Wansley. Please present that amendment. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is regards to a conversation that we had again around the the timeline for the CCPO. I do want to note that you know most ordinances that are passed by this body actually take effect within 30 days. Um, and if we were able to have question one take effect in 30 day, uh, 30 days, then we certainly can begin work for CCPO, um, especially since we know there is a significant amount of public interest in moving this forward. Um, 120 days is an unnecessary delay, especially since, again, the city facilitated the end of the functioning of the PCLC earlier this year. Um, and I think we've all agreed that having months without some type of oversight commission um, is not something that I, though, and I'm pretty sure the public is not comfortable with. And this amendment reflects the feedback that was given by the community and aligns the implementation of this ordinance on the timeline we typically have for majority of the legislative work that we do as a body. So creating that parity and with that, I will move this uh, amendment for consideration. Second. Thank There's a motion and a proper second. Any discussion? Is there any discussion? Council Vice President Palmasano. Madam Chair, I just need to offer a counterpoint. Most ordinances that we pass don't require posting for 15 applicants and then interviewing and then appointing them and then having in a national organization to help do their training and do the kind of onboarding um, that we've added into this ordinance to make it robust on race equity. Um, I don't think that that's reasonable for us to be able to do in 30 days, but I am eager to get started on this too. So I think it is that that is what's driving us forward through the consideration of these last amendments is that we are all eager to get this process started. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Accidentally hit that. I'm going to delete that. <laughs> Any further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vito. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are five ayes and six nays. That amendment carries. Five eyes. Six names. Oh, okay, my, my apologies. <laughs> um, so we have dispensed with uh, the Wansley amendments and we are returning to Council Member Chavez amendment. I'll just not put that five. to a vote, Council President. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir? Uh, Council President, I just will not put that to a vote. He pulled I'm, it. I'll withdraw it. He withdraws it. Oh, okay. I don't Thank think you. we have any others. Um, with that, 
Uh, I think we have uh, considered all the amendments to be made to this ordinance to date. Um, I do want to emphasize again, and, and I'll probably state this again, um, but as with any ordinance, this certainly is one that will require and should require additional review, um, additional um, amendments, as we noted in our deliberations. We talked about um, impact analysis and trying to understand what uh, policies may mean, and that is certainly the case for this ordinance as well. Uh, all of that said, we are back to the original ordinance offered by myself um, with the amendments, with the prevailing amendments um, as attached. And in queue, we have Council Members Chavez, Ellison, and Council Member Chavez just asked to be removed. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the process that we've had here. I know that um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago I had missed committee and was very concerned about whether or not I had all, my, all the information I needed in, or, in order to support this. Um, and I do also want to, uh, but I do appreciate the process that we've gotten up until this point. Um, I know that before he had to leave, Councilmember Johnson um, express some concern that he felt like this document was changing signif significantly today um, and that uh, and that he and others uh, and the public would like some additional time with this document. I think that Councilmember Wansley made raised a good point in saying that we took a lot of time to consider things like government structure. Um, and uh, and so I still feel like, you know, with some of the feedback from my colleagues and with uh, Councilmember Johnson making pretty much a direct request uh, for for this item to be delayed, uh, I would like to make a, would like to make a motion for this item to be delayed. Uh, I don't want that to be a reflection on how uh, Vice President Palmasano and President Jenkins have engaged in this discussion. I think that it's, that that it's been a good discussion. Um, if this item is not delayed, uh, I do think that I will. Uh, support it today, uh, but with how much this document has changed and with, uh, you know, one of our colleagues feeling, um, a number of our colleagues feeling like this, uh, uh, this work, a lot of this work has been done outside of committee, uh, thus this is, this is the time we're going to be voting on it. Um, uh, I'm going to still go ahead and, and, uh, and make that motion. Um, so, Second. thank you. Councilmember Ellison has moved to postpone. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there any further discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Wansley. No. Councilmember Osman. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Nay. There are four ayes and seven nays. That uh, motion fails, and we are back to the original motion. Uh, Councilmember Ellison. No, I'm sorry, Councilmember Osmond. Um, uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. I, I do want to thank. Um, council president, council vice president for really working on this document and also working with my colleagues. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, we're able to go somewhere from here. And like I say previous, this is a work in process. Uh, we can always come back to it. And um, it's a good intention for this to, to really make sure that, um, you know, our police officers are, are behaving the way we want them to behave and protecting the residents while our residents are safe. Um, so yeah, I do wanna thank you, Council President, uh, and all of you for um, uh, being patient and uh, working on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ellison. Uh, thank you, and I'll just echo Council Member Osmond's uh, sentiments. I know that uh, um, 
I was able to have a number of conversations with Council President, Council Vice President Palmasano as well, uh, uh, mainly about some of the changes. And I think that uh, there were a lot of, uh, uh, a number of changes that were added into the consensus document and, uh, and where there wasn't maybe a more earnest consensus, uh, all those items were taken up for a vote. And, um, and I think that this document changed a lot more than I thought it would. Uh, and so, you know, I still want to see improvements to this. It's, it's still not, you know, maybe exactly the ordinance that I would write, but that's rarely the case when we, when we make uh, laws together, when we make ordinances together. So I just want to thank uh, the council president and vice president for the process. Um, and I do believe that I'll be supporting this today. Thank you, council member. Council member B. -Town. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to quickly thank the Civil Rights Department for all the work that they've put into this process. You know, as the Chair of Public Health and Safety, they started meeting with me almost immediately after being sworn in about this. And although it's not perfect, I think that our staff has really been committed to this process and done a great job at getting us to this point. So again, I just want to thank the Civil Rights staff, um, specifically Andrew Hawkins, who has spent a lot of time with me and my staff and a lot of time in community talking through this process. I've appreciated uh, him in this process a lot, along with a lot of other civil rights staff. So thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, any further discussion? Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Wansley. Nay. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Nay. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shagtai. Nay. Councilmember Chavez. Nay. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are seven ayes, four nays. Uh, that carries, and that ordinance is adopted. Um, I do want to just take a moment to thank all of my colleagues for their um, insightful and um, passionate and committed um, attention to this ordinance, which I do have to correct what has been stated in public. It's been more than 10 days that we have been working on this. Um, we had three um, community sessions. Uh, we've had input from several um, community members about this process, um, and I, I think we have gotten to a really good uh, place. Is it perfect? No. Can it be improved? Absolutely, as with everything in life, and it is our duty to, to make that happen. I really want to thank... Um, Director Gillespie and her team, specifically um, Andrew Hawkins, for uh, his efforts, their efforts on creating this. I want to thank the city attorney who uh, spent many, many, many nights um, over um, looking over these amendments and helping us to get to a place where they meet the legal standards. Um, and um, yeah, thanks all of you for coming back for a final adjourned city council meeting. Uh, thank the clerk staff for all of their work to really, um, I mean, the flurry of amendments, changed amendments, revised amendments, um, has just been a really um, Herculean effort, I will say. And thank you, Clerk Carl, and to all of your staff and team for uh, helping us as a council to work through this. Um, we are adjourning this meeting, um, and um, we completed all of our remaining business. Uh, before I close the meeting, I will ask my colleagues if they have any announcements. Uh, Council President Jenkins, I did just want to thank our staff, Andrew and Director Gillespie. I, I do want to say I'm very thankful for your work throughout this entire process. Our city attorney who worked 
She received my emails very late at night and was willing to work and find language with my office to make sure that we can make this as powerful as, pro as possible. I do want to thank the council president and vice president for making sure that there was at least a compromise on moving the date to Tuesday with Councilman Chuck Tai and Councilman Payne. I know you all worked that out. I very much appreciated the extra time to be able to deliberate and make this ordinance as strong as possible. I wasn't able to support it based on three different things that I hope that we can find a compromise at least starting next year in January. I think I'm still concerned about that oversight of 120 days. I think we can find something to make sure that we can assure folks on that police accountability aspect. I do have my own separate opinion on the police uh, being on the oversight commission in terms of like, I think it should be civilian led. I think this body can find a compromise early January. And then I think that we can find a different method in, in the, the process that Councilman Payne was working on, on the employment and removal process. I think there's some stuff that we can work on. But I am very happy about how today went. Thankful for our, our council members here that were willing to like walk us through this entire process and support a lot of our amendments. And just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. Um, and to be clear, the amendments added to the strength of the ordinance. And so it, it, it's not about personalities, it's about trying to get this whole thing right. Uh, if I fail to thank the city attorney's office, which I think I did, but I will reiterate, we are grateful for your service. Um, you just came to the city and um, shepherded us through the tail end of our um, government restructuring and then through this very important um, ordinance that we are um, creating this community commission on police oversight. So thank you once again. And with that colleagues, we are adjourned. I wish everybody a happy and safe holiday season, whatever you celebrate. And uh, our next meeting is January 3rd, 2023.